Hello everyone and welcome to this Geoparks live special from Charnwood Forest aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark. We're very proud to be bringing you this special feed and coverage of today's events from the UNESCO Executive Board in Paris, where they will be, amongst many other matters, be discussing the eight new proposed UNESCO Global Geoparks. Now, it should be clear, um, Charmwood Forest isn't one of those. Our application will still take a few more years before we submit it. But we are very pleased to be uh, bringing you coverage of UNESCO today and to start a little early celebration with the eight new geoparks um, as they go through the final two stages of approval by the UNESCO Executive Board. My name's Dr. Jack Matthews. I am the Geoheritage Conservation and Interpretation Officer at the Charmwood Forest, aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark in the United Kingdom in the county of Leicestershire. And as we go through this morning, or indeed this afternoon and this evening, wherever you are in the world, um, we might tell you a little bit more about what we have to offer here in Charnwood Forest. We're also going to be telling you the story of how things work at UNESCO. International politics and diplomacy can be a confusing topic at times, and it can be um, difficult to understand what's going on in these arenas of power. So what we're going to do is follow along to this morning's discussion and just guide you through, explain what's happening and what implications that has on the process for how a geopark goes from being a community, a, a, an area that wants to celebrate its internationally significant geology, all the way through the processes of evaluation, the Global Geopark Council, and then onwards to the UNESCO Executive Board. Now, today we'll be seeing the first stage of that process in what's called the Programs and External Relations Commission, where the eight new geoparks will get their first hearing, their first discussion. Um, but the final vote, it should say, and I'll be repeating this, I make no apologies, I will be repeating this as the day goes on. Um, the final vote, it won't be real, it won't be eight new geoparks until the final vote in the plenary session of the Executive Board next Wednesday. But I'll explain a little bit more about that as the morning goes on. Shall we see if we can uh, bring up, there is the live feed from uh, UNESCO in Paris. We're in, I'm of course, uh, we can do all this over the joys of the internet. I'm here uh, in uh, in the UK, um, but this is the live feed from Paris UNESCO headquarters. Uh, UNESCO being the education, science and cultural organization of the United Nations. And because this is a big meeting, we're in, uh, I believe this is room one. Um, but we will just check we're in the right room. Apologies if I seem to look away at you. I'm having to look at uh, a number of different screens today um, to make sure we're bringing you all the news um, as it happens. You can see there that the delegates, the representatives are uh, just taking their seats. It's quite typical that they uh, don't start exactly on time. Um, and we'll guide you through some, how the process works, because it's a, it's a rather interesting process. But what you can see there is the, the representatives from the, uh, the uh, member states of UNESCO. And it should be said that the executive board is an elected subset of those um, elected from the geographical grouping. So you may often hear delegates discuss uh, group one or group three. And these are different groupings around the world, for example, uh, Europe or the Arab states or Africa, and what have you. So that's the way that the world uh, is divided up in terms of UNESCO. Uh, uh, and those blocks are used to vote people, uh, countries, member states onto the executive board. The executive board meets several times a year and there's certain levels of uh, 
uh, decisions that can be made by that. The kind of supreme power of the uh, UN of UNESCO is held by the General Conference, uh, which meets much less frequently, um, but in which all member states have a vote. So you can see that each country gets uh, a few uh, chairs um, at the at the very bottom left screen in the grey there is one of the representatives of uh, Iceland. You can see a small plastic sign in front of uh, the representative for uh, Iceland's head. And here we have the chair, or is actually the, I believe, the vice chair of the, uh, no, it's a chair of the programmes and external relations uh, commission. I believe this is the representative for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, who will be chairing today's events. And I will make sure that uh, when the representative starts to speak, we can listen in. Now, there will be a number of different matters being discussed today. So we'll have to hop in and hop out. We don't quite know when geoparks will be up for discussion. So we will have to, I'll guide you through. This is why we've started now. Let's listen in to the chair as she starts today's meeting. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. We have a hefty agenda ahead of us today and uh, we're looking forward for your uh, collaboration and for your active engagement. So we plan to begin our work now uh, we have a quorum and I declare open the 214th session of the Programme and External Relations Commission of the Executive Board. Excellencies, let us resume debate on item 10. We can continue with the next speaker, uh, speaker on our list, distinguished representative of Japan to be followed by Argentina. You have the floor. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Bonjour. Thank you, Madam. Good morning, colleagues. I'd like to extend our support for Monte 2022. We thank Mexico for having decided to host Monte 2022 in the same vein as the one held 20 years ago, and we're convinced that it will give a huge boost to mobilizing all international so players and will be an opportunity to identify of Japan speaking there. Um, just to give you some more background on what is happening here, um, unfortunately, not all of the agenda items from yesterday have been completed. Um, so yesterday, um, UNESCO... Uh, program and external relations uh, commission yesterday afternoon they were meant to uh, finish with two final items um, agenda item 10 which is what they are now completing uh, unesco world conference on cultural policies and sustainable development known as mondicult 2022 and it sounds like the delegate from japan is saying that that will be hosted uh, by mexico um, so the debate is still to go on there. Um, after that, we expect debate on agenda item 29, uh, UNESCO and the ocean. Um, and it would be expected that there will be some debate on that. Now, what we expect to happen after that is to get back onto the debate that was meant to happen uh, this morning. There were uh, three items up for debate this morning. The first, well, they're listed in order, but this is the thing. The chair of the UNESCO executive board and the commissions of the board uh, can move things around as they so choose. That's why we have uh, started this live stream, special live stream, bringing you live coverage of the Geopark discussions from UNESCO HQ in Paris. That's why we bought it now, because we don't know when exactly the debate on UNESCO Global Geoparks will begin. We know that they had planned this morning to have 
discussion on agenda item 27, which is the road to peace, dialogue and action for tolerance and intercultural understanding. Also, agenda item 25, proclamation of the World Russian Language Day. And then agenda item nine, which is the one we are all waiting for as Geopark fanatics, UNESCO Global Geoparks. Now, it should be said that the agenda item uh, on UNESCO Global Geoparks has been starred by the preparatory group of the UNESCO Executive Board. And this is to suggest that it is so uncontroversial that these eight new geoparks should be approved, that indeed there is no need for debate. Now, one might therefore assume that there will simply be a vote and it will go through and we will move on. But usually what happens when there's a matter of no debate is the representatives will approve the motion before them of the eight new geoparks and then the floor will be opened up to uh, delegates on the floor and what we might expect to happen is some of the countries who are to expect to get a new geopark may wish to make a statement so we it would be very interesting to see some of those countries uh, who are expected to get a new unesco global geopark this year what they're going to be saying about their nearly new geopark because as i will stress over and over again today is not the final step so unfortunately for those eight uh, nearly new geoparks they will have to wait a little bit longer what will happen in terms of procedure is today the commission will go in depth into the points that they have been tasked with discussing um, they will vote on those and make a draft proposal and report to the entire UNESCO executive board. It's a way of the executive board splitting up the points that it needs to discuss. They then meet in separate rooms to discuss those points and the recommendations come back together to be uh, finally approved by what's called the plenary session. There's uh, plenary sessions at the start of the meeting, plenary sessions at the end of the executive board. Uh, as well. And we expect next Wednesday, that's Wednesday the 13th of April, the plenary session will meet and will hear the report of the Programme and External Relations Commission, which will be presented by uh, the chair. And at that point, when that is voted and approved and the gavel comes down, and they still like to use a gavel in UNESCO circles, that is the point at which we will have officially eight new UNESCO Global Geoparks. I'll be reminding you of all of this uh, again and again as we go through, because we're probably in for a long haul this morning. Um, just a reminder, we are here this morning waiting on the Proposals for eight new geoparks being discussed by the Programmes and External Relations Commission of the UNESCO Executive Board. There's been a bit of a delay because not all the business could be discussed yesterday. So we are waiting on that information to come through of when the geopark motion will be uh, brought forward. But we expect they will finish uh, First, as they, we can currently see the distinguished delegate from uh, Italy there uh, speaking to Motion 10 on the UNESCO World Conference on Cultural Policies and Sustainable um, Development. And uh, I have, if I was to make a prediction, I would make a prediction that the Geopark motion might not be left until last. Um, it would be an easy one for the chair to ask delegates if they wanted to bring it forward. And one of the reasons, uh, unfortunately, geopark, geoparks are going to get caught up in broader geopolitics this morning. Uh, the motion next to geoparks on the agenda of this commission is for the proclamation of a World Russian Language Day. Viewers will be aware that there's been an ongoing conflict 
in Ukraine, and this has been a point of discussion by delegates at UNESCO over the past week, um, many nations uh, raising that point in their speeches, and some have already said that they will oppose the World Russian Language Day. So in what will be quite unusual moves, because these motions do normally go through quite quickly, but they also normally have a broader geographical support to them than the proposal for a World Russian Language Day. So we will wait and see what happens with that. If the Geopark motion isn't heard before the proclamation of the World Russian Language Day proposal, then it could be um, that we're going to have to bring you a second live stream this afternoon to cover what happens. But we will be with you whatever happens. I should say, if you have any questions, um, you can ask them via the comment section in either Facebook or YouTube, and we'll try and address as many of those as we can as we go through today for what we hope will be a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, let's just uh, take a moment and tune back in to see what is being said by the delegates. Uh, having as an output. The first one is to ensure that uh, the human rights-based approach uh, that UNESCO is adopting uh, for its programs is, imply is applied in uh, the culture sector in all the domains, including uh, the restitution uh, of cultural properties, as it has been highlighted in the consultations, and I think I heard it also from several delegations, including Kenya. The second one is that uh, we would like also to see the outcome, one of the outcomes of this conference, the repositioning of culture in the in the international development agenda. Uh, the uh, SDGs uh, goals and the program 2000, uh, 2030 uh, does not include a separate goal for uh, for culture. Uh, we we say that culture is everywhere, transversal, etc. But I think it might be a good idea to think and to reflect whether uh, this conference can be used so that in the upcoming pre pre period, post-2030, uh, culture be uh, having a separate uh, goal. The third one, and I will be very quick, sorry, the third one is that we would like to see uh, a more robust UNESCO, uh, including uh, the six culture conventions. Uh, and the fourth point is that we will also see uh, the, the culture sector, uh, the gaps international that we are witnessing in the last two years in terms of development and support between the north and the south be uh, a gap uh, filled. But I will just go immediately to the question, Madam Chair. Uh, I would like to know from the Secretariat what is the process for the elaboration of the declaration and uh, when, when, how countries will participate and starting from when. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, I would like to give the floor to a distinguished representative of Uruguay to be followed by... So Poland. there you can see a question Ask that Thank you, Madam. And good morning, everyone. The Secretariat, which are the staff uh, the that general conference the last November, the distinguished colleagues from Nesco the permanent works. delegation of Turkey said that what matters is to have a friendly voice uh, in the sky. And we can say that Mexico is, um, through its efforts, together with UNESCO, uh, conveying a uh, friendly voice. Uh, in the skies, and Uruguay supports the entire process pertaining to Monte Cult with the understanding of the relevance of this meeting, which will um, allow there to be a multilateral debate on culture and its future and its governance <clears throat> and the impact of COVID on artists, as well as technologies and the future of cultural industries and the status of uh, artists. And the regional consultations have been a decisive uh, strive forward in uh, this process and we are especially grateful for the final support for this event uh, so that we can have a negotiating process and a declaration process which is transparent and inclusive as well as participatory and we support the amendment referred to Paraguay submitted by Mexico regarding paragraph 7. We'd like to know whether it's possible to uh, find a way of giving follow-up to the results of this conference and we are sure that um, 
the contribution of the Mexican people will be um, notable and we will all bring to bear our intellectual and emotional cap cap capabilities to give the necessary boost to this process. And lastly, Madam May, I say that uh, our tasks are collective ones or they don't happen at all. We can't act in isolation. But um, it, this is a process which may not necessarily be tangible. And Gustavo Morales, our dear friend from the Mexican delegation, is uh, the sort of person who's allowed us to see through his passion and dedication, Monte Cult with all its strength and potential. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, I would like to give the floor to the distinguished representative of Poland, which I can barely see right now. Happy to see you. But before that, uh, I would just want to say that after Poland, I want to give the floor to the distinguished representative of Togo after Poland. So, uh, Poland, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and good morning, everyone. Poland strongly supports the initiative of the government of Mexico to host the Intergovernmental and Ministerial Conference on Cultural Policies, Mondia Cult. The 40 years that passed since the last meeting make this initiative very timely and important. Poland was pleased to take part in the regional consultations that started at the end of last week, year. Uh, we were very glad with the outcome of the exchange of views on the trends and objectives of cultural policies in different countries in the region. The importance of the issue is beyond doubt in the context of the 2030 Agenda and SDGs on one hand, and on the other, the need to much rethink the world as a consequence of current crises, technological development and its complex implications. The Russian aggression on Ukraine demands from us to especially focus on and perhaps review our instruments regarding culture and emergencies. The enhanced protection of artists, cultural workers, media workers and journalists, as well as the protection of cultural heritage, museums, collections and archives is of vital importance. We are very much looking forward to examine the results of the preparatory process, which will lead us to the World Conference of Cult on Cultural Policies and Sustainable Development. Poland supports the proposed DR. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Poland. I would like now to give the... There you saw the distinguished delegate from Poland uh, using a bit of uh, UNESCO language there. DR is a draft recommendation We'll go into the delegate from Togo, who is a long-standing representative in the UNESCO Executive Board. Um, and well, indeed, in his plenary speech a few days ago, uh, mentioned the importance of earth sciences education in Africa. On having decided to host Mondia Cult for a second time in 2022, a Category 2 meeting, and the delegation of Togo also is gratified that this World Conference is being prepared in accordance with the rules regarding regional consultations, which took place in December 2021 and February 2022. And the regional document, the documents from those regional consultations are available to us. And we also welcome the success of these consultations because the report says that in preparing the draft declaration to be discussed in Mexico, there are already 151 written contributions which have come to the Secretariat, which is a record and we welcome this inclusiveness and we hope that the ultimate declaration may reflect the worldwide aspirations in this field and we also support the draft decision in paragraph 10 of the document and we wish to ask whether this world conference will afford an opportunity for um, being followed online. Delegations who can't go to Mexico, uh, will they be able to uh, follow the event online? So at least they are kept abreast of the debates in that important conference. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to give the floor now to the distinguished uh, the representative of South Africa to be followed by the... That was the speaker from Togo, who, as I said, has been a great proponent of the geosciences and earth sciences within UNESCO. UNESCO being the only UN body which has responsibility for the geological sciences. And so it was good to see that representative a few days ago raising the importance of the work that UNESCO has been doing on geoscience education uh, in Africa. Um, now, it seems like we will be in uh, agenda item number 10 for a while. So while we're waiting, why not let's consider a little bit of more about what a geopark is. So let's cut away from the UNESCO Executive Board for a moment and see a little video that'll explain a little bit more about what is a UNESCO Global Geopark. <music> Since 1972, UNESCO has been making a contribution to peace building and sustainable development in its member states thanks to its unique remit in earth sciences. What is a UNESCO Global Geopark? They are the most recent UNESCO site designations for protecting geological sites of international significance. The 195 members of UNESCO ratified the creation of a new UNESCO label, the UNESCO Global Geoparks, on the 17th of November 2015. The decision was taken by member states at UNESCO's General Conference, the governing body of the organisation. This expressed governmental recognition of the importance of managing outstanding geological sites and landscapes in a holistic manner. As of 2021, there are 161 UNESCO Global Geoparks in 44 countries. So how do we distinguish UNESCO Global Geoparks from UNESCO World Heritage Sites and UNESCO Biosphere Reserves, which are the other two prestigious labels of UNESCO site designations? The UNESCO Global Geoparks are sites and landscapes of international geological significance as independently verified by scientific professionals. It's important that they're identified as single, unified geographical areas. They cannot be made up of separate, smaller areas within a region. They will typically have a multitude of sites of specific interest and must be contained within the designated area. Within the geopark, there will be links between the area's geological heritage and its natural, cultural, an intangible heritage. So in a region, local people will celebrate their unique geological heritage and combine those features with their rich cultural heritage, their landscape, wildlife, food, people, storytelling. Each one combined is used to promote the region's earth history. So what are the advantages of UNESCO Global Geoparks for UNESCO member states? A UNESCO Global Geopark uses its geological heritage in connection with all other aspects of the area's natural and cultural heritage to enhance awareness and understanding of key issues facing society, such as using our planet's resources sustainably, reducing the impact of natural disasters, mitigating the effects of climate change. The key to solving these issues is that the UNESCO Global Geoparks should use that heritage in connection with all other aspects of that area's natural and cultural heritage to promote awareness of key issues facing society in the context of the dynamic planet we all live in, including, but not limited to, increasing knowledge and understanding of geoprocesses, geohazards, climate change, the need for the sustainable use of Earth's natural resources, the evolution of life, and the empowerment of indigenous peoples. They'll be managed with a holistic concept of protection, education, and sustainable development. 
the creation of innovative local enterprises, new jobs and high quality training courses is stimulated as new sources of revenue are generated through geotourism, whilst the geological resources of the area are protected. By raising awareness of the importance of the area's geological heritage in history and society today, UNESCO Global Geoparks give local people a sense of pride in their region and strengthen their identification with the area. If you would like to become part of UNESCO's Global Geoparks family, please contact us. That was, of course, Professor Ian Stewart narrating the video by UNESCO there, explaining a little bit more about what a geopark is. Um, welcome once more to those that are joining us. We are watching live to this morning's discussions from the programmes an external relations commission of the UNESCO executive board in Paris. There you can see the distinguished delegate of Vietnam who is speaking on agenda item number 10. Um, the Executive Board Programs and External Relations Commission is a little behind on timing. So there are a few uh, points that are being debated from yesterday and we are waiting to hear that. So expect the Geopark discussion to be a little later in the day, perhaps later than we might have expected, but we'll keep you updated with everything that's happening as the morning goes on. Hopefully they can catch up on some time. While we are waiting, I will take this moment to tell you a little bit more about what makes Charmwood Forest special. It is found in the northwest of Leicestershire and is more than uh, around 150 square kilometres of unexpected upland in the beautiful Leicestershire countryside. And to tell us a little bit more, um, we have one of our local council, local authority areas, has recently produced a lovely video that tells you why this area is... So it's time to discover Charnwood. Perfectly located right in the centre of the country and enjoying superb transport links, there is no better place to visit, work and live. For nearly 600 million years, the powerful forces of nature have been sculpting our breathtaking landscapes. Evidence of our unique geological history is scattered among picturesque villages and can be experienced up close in the rocks of Bradgate Park and Beacon Hill. Such is the importance of Charnwood Forest, it is now an aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark. At the heart of this dramatic landscape is the dynamic university and market town of Loughborough, home to the last major bell foundry in the UK, 800-year-old markets and the Great Central Heritage Railway. Future our award-winning Loughborough University and cutting-edge science and enterprise parks are leading world-class research, innovation and sport and nurturing the stars and heroes of future generations. Discover Charnwood, a fascinating destination promising a non-stop voyage from ancient origins to future potential. In Charnwood, we are shaping tomorrow's world today. Thank you to uh, Charmwood Borough Council, that wonderful video telling you of some of the wonderful treats that you can find in Charmwood Forest. Charmwood Borough co covering part of what will hopefully become the Charmwood Forest UNESCO Global Geopark, though it might be a few years yet. We are still on our way. There you can see the distinguished delegate from Tunisia, um, the Programs and External Relations Commission is still debating uh, agenda item number 10, um, but we will stick with it this morning. Um, I'm going to cut across to the feed now, just so we can hear the chair and catch up on what is happening.
charge of culture. It's also the artists, the practitioners, those who invent, who create young people, and those who uh, are, are the real bearers of uh, culture that need to be involved. And, and so if we are able to uh, conceptualize culture uh, in a new way, then this will be a huge success uh, uh, as an outcome of this event. Uh, my country is firmly committed to uh, this event, and we're delighted to take part in the pre in the lead up uh, consultation process uh, spearheaded by um, uh, Saudi Arabia and also the work done here at the House. Uh, and um, so we should just like to reiterate our thanks to Secretariat for the presentation and for the draft uh, decision that, that is before us and extend our thanks once again to the Mexican authorities for what they've already done and what they are yet to do as we move towards this important rendezvous. Thank you. Shukran. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to move to the uh, observers. We have on our list uh, Nigeria. You have the floor, Your Excellency. So here we have observers talking in the commission. Um, these are observers will be uh, member states who are members of UNESCO, but are not elected on to the executive board. And there are also other organizations that are observers of UNESCO also. But most of these will be member states of UNESCO who have the right to speak after the voting members of the executive board, but are not voting members of the executive board and therefore not voting members of any of the commissions. Let's tune in to hear what the distinguished delegate from Nigeria has to say. In 2025, the culture, creative, hospitality and tourism section will be economic driver in the country. We thank the Director General for convening the Moodya College 2022 and UNESCO for hosting it. Our main contribution to this debate is to highlight the importance of divide uh, in the conference follow up action, well mentioned in the document 214 EX10. We encourage the culture and education sector to continue and consider joint action aimed at revitalizing national Tibet system to respond to the needs and priorities of national cultural policies. Perhaps the first step is mapping of culture-related Tibet programs. Nigeria is ready to cooperate with member states having success stories in Tibet activities and aim at supporting culture-related entrepreneurship. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Nigeria. Uh, with that, uh, we have exhausted our uh, list of speakers. Uh, we came to a, a very, very interesting uh, number of questions. I think what, what the whole floor agrees upon is that the enthusiasm and then the engagement in, in Mundia cult and how this positive spirit is being taken forward. Uh, it's a really amazing way to start the day. I hope we continue the same. Uh, with that, I turn to the representative of the Director General. Um, please, uh, Ms. Paula, uh, Hold on, I have to understand. Leoncini, is it? Yes. So, um, please, there's a number of questions there uh, that we have got. One of them, uh, a lot of them about the consultations, and if you allow me to group them, uh, and a number of member states, um, uh, Lithuania, Aust Austria, Iceland, uh, mentioned that, that the plans for consultations are appreciated, but request further details. Uh, other members requested further detail on the role of the national commissions uh, that might play in these consultations. And if I recall uh, very well, I think it is uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, another on the substance of the conference, but you can move one by one. But again, let's let's start with the uh, consultation process, and then we can move forward. Thank you, Madam President. First of all, I should just like to reiterate the Secretariat's gratitude to the government of Mexico 
for hosting 40 years after the very first Mondial Conference in 1982, this new iteration on Mexican territory. We extend our gratitude to you and we will continue to be working with you hand in hand or with the Mexican government to make sure that this conference is an outstanding success. La Presidente. Madam Chair, I also wish to extend our thanks to the entire culture sector for all of the uh, uh, positive encouragements that they have expressed vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, uh, Mondia Culture, Cultural Policies and Sustainable Development, to the 23 different interventions in yesterday's afternoon session and this morning, uh, and uh, uh, the, um, the statement by Nigeria as an observer, I think attest to your commitment uh, to commitment and the role that UNESCO plays on the international stage. Uh, to uh, to advocate uh, uh, culture and its role in society when it comes comes to creating peaceful, inclusive, uh, and cohesive societies, and the vital role uh, played by cultural uh, diversity in this uh, regard when it comes to building that inclusiveness and dialogue between countries and within countries. I should like to try to respond to some of the questions uh, that were raised, uh, as uh, you mentioned, Madam Chair. Perhaps I could start with the final statement. Uh, many of you underscored the importance uh, of your commitment and involvement uh, towards the shaping of this final declaration. I just wanted to reassure everyone that the Secretariat has already provided for this uh, drafting of the final declaration, which should get started uh, early May. In other words, uh, quite ahead of the conference, and I do take on board what France was saying on this matter. Um, there will be opportunities to discuss this closely with uh, the member states and there'll be two parallel tracks. On the one hand, there'll be a circular letter extended to all um, delegations, uh, which, which is what we call our zero draft, which is just an, an, a, a preliminary rough draft of the uh, declaration. And then the, uh, the secretariat will uh, draft this uh, on a basis of the emerging priorities from the regional consultations and and which will be uh, listed in the addendum to the document that you ha you will have, uh, but also during the executive board uh, sessions, as some uh, countries have already uh, mentioned, like Azerbaijan, uh, Poland, uh, Egypt, and Lithuania, and others mentioned. Uh, so the Secretariat will take all of that on board and come up with a very preliminary text, which will be sent to you, and, and this will be seeking your feedback uh, through as a circular letter. From there, we would like to encourage the very rich and dynamic uh, regional processes so that you uh, can give us your input and so that we will uh, come up with a, a text that you will have before you. This process uh, is going to run from May through June of this year. In other words, just after the executive board, the secretariat will get down to brass tacks and uh, start uh, uh, drafting the, uh, the initial uh, uh, document ready for your feedback. Obviously, the preparatory process for the Secretariat will then continue right through to late July. As you can imagine, the conference uh, is to be held in late September. And obviously, we are uh, at your disposal if you, re if you require any further details about this process. Now I should like uh, to come back to a couple of more specific questions that were raised, particular the uh, final outcome. What are the expectations of UNESCO and how to embody that in our, um, in our program and priorities? Remember, we are a house made up of member states and we hope that when we come up with a final declaration, uh, it, they will, it will embody that uh, commitment from you and be reflected in the program and budget that 
that is being approved and decided upon by the member states themselves. Um, you talked about uh, the cultural conventions and their central importance uh, in this, um, and we do hope that the final declaration text uh, will also underscore those priorities, which are your priorities when it comes we're going to stick with this feed for a moment so we can hear what the chair has to say. We might find a little bit more about when the Geopark discussion is coming up at the moment. The representative of the Director General of, the UNESCO, uh, of UNESCO, the Director General being the most senior officer of UNESCO, ex elected for, I believe it's a four-year term, it might be a two-year term, but elected by the member states to lead um, UNESCO, they are the equivalent of the Secretary General of UN leading that body forward. Of course, they can't be everywhere at once. There's multiple meetings going on in UNESCO at the moment. And so their representative is responding to some of the questions that have come up on the discussion of agenda item number 10, which is the UNESCO World Conference on Cultural Policies and Sustainable Development. Let's listen in a little bit more. Hopefully we'll hear from the chair soon and get a little bit of more information about when the discussion might be coming up on the eight new UNESCO global geoparks. Creativity, um, uh, intangible cultural expressions, UNESCO will uh, uh, continue to focus uh, on this uh, and will ensure that it's reflected in the final uh, declaration or at least the drafts uh, leading thereto, so that cultural diversity um, and its role in ensuring stability in countries and, uh, and its role in economic and social development of countries is recognised. Um, and obviously, when we're talking about uh, the uh, importance uh, of the econ uh, the creative economy, digital aspects are uh, a key concern for UNESCO. And the Secretariat is naturally looking at the very different uh, aspects of the digital environment, uh, be it on the diversity of cultural contents, multilingualism, uh, and also the uh, protection of creators' rights. All of these issues are at the core of our work. You know, UNESCO already does have several uh, important tools on this. We've, we've talked about the uh, 2005 convention. We also have the recommendation on the statu um, status of artists, uh, um, uh, which uh, was uh, uh, and uh, which it's also overlaps with the work of the committee of the 2005 convention. Because remember, it was in uh, 1980. Um, the, uh, the the digital world didn't have the same importance that it has today. So all of this uh, is being discussed in the context context of the uh, convention and we really hope that we'll get your input uh, um, when it comes to drafting that final declaration. Just to come back to two specific points, if I may. Firstly, to respond uh, to the DRC's concern and uh, to reassure the distinguished delegate uh, of, uh, the, uh, of uh, the DRC that um, we are very, very active uh, when it comes to the uh, expressing the importance of regional consultation processes. National um, commissions are still going to be very important because they are the interlocutors who receive uh, those uh, um, uh, our messages, our circulars, uh, and uh, you will be invited uh, to um, uh, to uh, continue to consult the uh, Mondia Cult website that's been specially created, which will provide lots of information to NatComs. Uh, and also as concerns a question for uh, online, um, the possibility to follow the meeting uh, online, which I think came from Togo, um, we are working with the authorities of Mexico to uh, try to ensure that um, this retransmission uh, um, or read broadcaster will be possible and we will keep you informed. Another issue, one that was raised, if I'm not mistaken, by Egypt uh, concerned uh, the um, the pre and post 2013. Austria talked about this yesterday, actually. As you know, UNESCO uh, over for the last few years has been coordinating the the SG's uh, report on uh, uh, on uh, sustainable development in other words we're in charge of coordinating the the reports for that the last report came out in lo November of last year and UNESCO is really at the origin of this advocacy work to 
put forward uh, uh, solutions uh, um, to the UN. The last one embodied uh, this uh, very strong call by UNESCO and its um, uh, and its member states, and uh, the UN uh, uh, GA picked up on that and offered a central place to the role of culture in uh, and the uh, creative economies uh, for the peaceful development of societies. Uh, obviously, we're in your hands. Um, the Monte Cult Conference um, will address this issue, and we feel that it was a very explicitly mentioned uh, um, um, uh, guiding thread from the regional consultation process. And since we see it as uh, a common good, culture as a common good, then the role that it can play when it comes to creating a space for dialogue that is de democratic and, uh, and propitious to freedom of expression obviously is important. You also mentioned uh, human human rights and the role, uh, how that dovetails with uh, this issue. And uh, when we look at our common agenda, there's a whole chapter on uh, the, what is considered the, the this common good, a public good. And uh, so we are very closely following uh, how the Mondia Cult uh, uh, a final declaration could actually uh, contribute to the uh, to the overall UN um, uh, the overall UN approach to culture. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this extensive uh, uh, answers. I think you covered all the questions that were there brilliantly. Um, uh, with this uh, happy and and uh, positive. Uh, explanation that we have all received. I think uh, there is are no any no more questions or no follow up questions. Uh, there is Switzerland. I see Switzerland. Their uh, plate is up. Please, you have the floor. Um, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Good morning to one and all, and thank you very much to the Secretariat as well for those very detailed explanations. You can see there that the delegate from Switzerland has placed his uh, country member state card vertically. And that is the way that delegates in what is a very large room indicate to the chair that they wish to speak. So that is why on the left hand side of the screen there, you're able to see Swiss, the French version of Switzerland there vertically. It's the way of expressing to the chair that they wish to speak. Jen, which uh, obviously is of great importance to the Secretariat uh, uh, when it comes to our approach to ensuring uh, an inclusive and uh, participative process. Regional consultations, well, obviously they've already been held. Um, uh, countries uh, remain very mobilized uh, in this regard. And we have, throughout the preparation process, uh, we've kept very close contact with the uh, regional consultation bureaus. You know that these uh, happens; uh, these have happened under the aegis of certain countries who agreed to spearhead the, re the regional uh, consultation process. So we use those uh, offices. In other words, it could be the uh, vice chair and uh, and rapporteur uh, for each. Uh, uh, region and uh, it was um, it was thanks to that process that you were able to have this document before you, and this is going to be followed up by countries uh, who had the responsibility of acting as moderators or facilitators for these regional processes throughout the preparatory process. So that is going to be continued, if you like, prolonged right through uh, to June uh, and early July. Moreover. Obviously, the conference is going to be a Category 2 conference. And as you know, a bureau um, for the meeting needs to be established. And in this regard, the ADG for Culture uh, did actually already send um, letters to each of the, the presidents of uh, all of the regional groups so that they could select their representative to sit on that uh, bureau, which is going to be for formally uh, created uh, once the conference opens in Mexico. And uh, obviously, the declaration will be and continue to be the subject of discussion right throughout the conference itself. I hope that I've answered uh, Swiss's, uh, Switzerland's uh, question. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have covered all the questions and uh, which have been answered by uh, the representative of the Director General. Uh, let us now proceed to examine, uh, and thank you for your answers. Uh, let's proceed now to examine the draft decision for document 214 EX10 contained in paragraph 10. Please, can you display it on the screen? Uh, and uh, so that we can discuss it. Uh, we can go paragraph by paragraph, and uh, starting with paragraph one, can we adopt? Adopted. Paragraph two, can we adopt? What we are seeing here is a, another very interesting part of how UNESCO decision making occurs. You can see at the bottom there, the chair of the Programme and External Relations Commission her Royal Highness Princess Haifa al Mogrin of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, and then behind her, up on the screen, and this is projected on two large screens within the meeting room that delegates are meeting in, um, a French version and an English version of the official text. And that's what they're going through now. Both of those need to be agreed because they're both um, official. And you can see that sometimes they are edited in real time um, by uh, live translators who are often listening to an amendment being proposed in one language and then having to translate it into another live. So what I believe has just happened is the chair has led people through the draft resolution and they have approved paragraph by paragraph um, paragraphs one to six. They're now debating paragraph seven of the proposal on uh, the meeting in Mexico, the UNESCO World Conference on Cultural Policies and Sustainable Development. You can see there an amendment has been proposed by GRULAC, which is a group of member states of UNESCO who all work together on various uh, issues. You can see they've proposed that. I think the original text was proposed in English and Spanish and has since been translated, but it looks like the hammer's going down. Seven. Yes, you have the floor, Mexico. And the Mexican yes, uh... delegation, uh, the Mexican delegation want to speak on the proposal, perhaps on that final amendment. Uh welcome the approval of uh, this very important decision concerning mondia Cult. the preparatory process has uh, been a massive inclusive uh, process uh, building on our very fruitful diversity and building on uh, the regional consultation process, uh, uh, which commenced at the end of last year. The exchanges uh, and uh, follow and uh, follow on exchanges of building on this consulting uh, consultation process in every region has been of vital importance um, when thinking about the final shape of the of the final declaration on our cultural policies. Um, Madam Chair, I just wanted to uh, commend uh, all of the regional um, presidents, uh, Croatia, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, and Senegal for all of their work. I wanted to acknowledge um, the excellent work uh, uh, for coordination undertaken also by the Secretariat and extend my thanks to all of those countries who expressed uh, their support for the holding of Mondia Cult this coming September. The work going into drafting a final declaration for the conference is going to have to continue in this uh, constructive, participative uh, uh, process uh, to enable us to overcome the challenges before us. Um, let us not forget, dear colleagues and friends, um, that um, in these difficult moments, Mandia Cult is going to open a window of hope. Mexico is getting ready to host you all with open arms.
Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And if you would allow me, we would like to adopt the decision as a whole. Can we adopt? Adopted. Congratulations. Now, we are done with this item and we'd like to move now to the next item on our timetable. It's item 29, UNESCO and the ocean. This item is proposed by the following member states, Colombia, Egypt, Kenya, Monaco, Morocco, Oman, Palau, Portugal, Serbia, and Togo. Since publishing the item, the following members of the executive board have indicated their support for the item. Djibouti, Hungary, Kuwait, Philippines, Republic of Korea, Turkey, Uruguay, and Vietnam. In addition, the following observer member states have also indicated their support. Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Greece, Indonesia, and Latvia. The reference documents for this item are 214 EX29, 214 EXDG, ENF, REV. The proposed draft decision for this item can be found in paragraph 8 of document 214 EX29. I would like to invite now the distinguished representative of Egypt to introduce the item. You have the floor. شكرا سيدتي الرئيسة يشرفني أن أعرض اليوم على اللجنة الموقرة مشروع Welcome back to those joining us live from the UNESCO Executive Board. My name is Jack Matthews, the Charmwood Forest Geo, uh, UNESCO, uh, aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark here in the United Kingdom. We're watching events live in Paris as the discussions go on. Um, it does appear that things are a little behind schedule this morning. Representatives have just approved uh, in the Programme and External Relations Commission, the Proposal 10, UNESCO World Conference on Cultural Policies and Sustainable Development. And as viewers will just have seen, the Chair of the Programme and External Relations Commission has just opened discussion on UNESCO and the ocean proposed by the representative of Egypt there. So these were matters which were expected to be debated yesterday afternoon, but they have been caught over. It is believed that that was due to a long debate on UNESCO's work within Afghanistan that drew out into a long debate and discussion. Now, if the chair does continue to follow the exact ordering on the order paper, we will need to go through this proposal on UNESCO and the ocean um, before moving on to the road to peace, dialogue and action for the tolerance and intercultural, sorry, the road to peace, dialogue and action for tolerance and intercultural understanding. And then following that is the proclamation of the World Russian Language Day, agenda item 29. Um, I should say if viewers wish to know more about the agenda items, the documents um, that are being discussed, if they go along to unesco.org forward slash en forward slash executive dash board or just google search unesco executive board you will be able to find the documents being discussed in all six official languages of the united nations english chinese russian french spanish and arabic uh, and you can find all of those online and available um, it should be said that that was a, a perfect example from the chair of the Programme and External Relations Commission there, Her Royal Highness Princess Haifa al Mogrin of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, very clearly introducing the next item uh, and both giving the countries that were supporting it in advance, those that have since added their name, and importantly, the reference documents that will be discussed. This item is just being introduced by the delegate from Egypt, so we can probably expect this to go on uh, uh, 
for a while because I, there are so many uh, countries that are supporting this. I should I would not like to imply that because uh, Egypt has uh, 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 proposed it that it will go on for a long. That was poor timing on my wording. Simply that there are so many nations uh, supporting this very good proposal that uh, I think many will want to speak on this important proposal today in UNESCO. So while we are waiting for more words to come on when UNESCO is, we'll tell you a little bit more about what makes Charmwood Forest so important here in the United Kingdom, a wonderful geopark that has rocks that go back nearly 600 million years. And within those rocks are evidence of some of the oldest animals in the world. Last year, we had the privilege of speaking to Dr. Frankie Dunn of the Oxford University Museum of Natural History on the outcomes of some of her very interesting re research on the fossils of Charmwood Forest. And I'm going to play you a short video now where you can learn a little bit more about why the fossils of Charmwood Forest are of such international significance. We're very excited to be in the Oxford University Museum of Natural History today to meet Dr. Frankie Dunn, who has a very interesting study out in the scientific press. And it's got something to do with the ancient geology of Charnwood Forest. So tell us, Frankie, what have you been studying in Charnwood Forest? Well, there are um, fossils within Charnwood Forest that date back to a geological period called the Ediacaran. So the Ediacaran span from about 635 to about 540 million years ago, so a very long time ago. And the fossils um, in Charnwood Forest are about 560 million years old. And this is a really important time because the geological period that follows the Ediacaran, the Cambrian period, is when animals um, start to appear globally and in huge number. And it's been this kind of paleontological mystery. Where do animals come from? And are there any animals amongst the strange fossils of the Ediacaran period? And we find these strange fossils in the Ediacaran rocks of Charnwood Forest. Um, and one fossil that I've been studying is called Charnia, and it's named after Charnwood Forest because that's where it was first uh, described. And it kind of looks like a strange fern frond. I think we have here. We do. We're lucky enough to have a cast. This is a replica that's in the, uh, in the collections here at the museum. Do you want to take us through why is it so strange? So I guess if you um, had never looked at a charnia before, you might think that it looks a lot like a plant, like a fern. But actually, we know that it was growing uh, deep on the seafloor, out of the photic zone. So unlike plants, it couldn't photosynthesize. And this led to um, a suite of different hypotheses about what charnia might be. If it's not a plant, is it an animal? Um, is it a fungus? Is it something that's not closely related to animals or fungi that is totally extinct? <coughs> and this has been um, yeah, kind of a mystery for the last 70 years since this discovery. So as you've been looking at this strange creature that lived in the deep, dark ocean 560 million years ago, what have you been doing? How have you been studying this strange creature, Charnia? Uh, how has that been helping you to work out what this is? So, um, as I've said now, probably exhaustively, Charnia doesn't really look like anything that's alive today. And so people have used anatomical characters. So, um, for example, we have an arm, that would be an anatomical character. They've used um, anatomical characters to try to ally, ally Charnia to living groups, but without huge amounts of success. So I'm particularly interested in growth and development. And we were able to study how Charnia grew, because in Charmwood Forest, there's a whole population of Charnias uh, ranging from about two centimeters to about uh, 45 centimeters on one single fossil bed. And so we were able to count the number of branches. Um, and you might be able to see that there are, there are branches within branches, and we were able to count those as well and compare the number and size of these branches between different specimens of Charnia 
of different sizes to work out how it was growing over time. So there's a very special place in Charnwood Forest. Unfortunately, it has to be kept secret because it's so important to paleontologists. And at this site, there are these wonderful, wonderful specimens. And you've been measuring them all, putting all of that information together. Now, tell us, what's the big result? Charnia grew um, like animals grow today. And the way Charnia grows, it's not just like animals, but it's not like lots of other things, uh, like fungi, to which Charnia has been previously compared. Um, and we can use this growth data alongside other facets of Charnia's anatomy to work out exactly where in the animal tree of life Charnia sits. Um, and we recover it as most closely related to a group called the Eumetazoans. So that includes jellyfish, um, insects, and us. So it's most of the diversity of living animal life. So Frankie's just introduced us there to the club of organisms, specifically animals that are Eumetazoa, jellyfish, insects, us, many, many other things. But it's interesting, what are the, just so people at home can understand, what are the animals that are not eumetazoa? Oh, there aren't many. Um, sponges are an example of animals which are not eumetazoans. And in fact, I think a lot of people don't recognize immediately that sponges are animals, uh, but they are. And a number of people think that they are, in fact, some of the very oldest animals. So characters which define the group eumetazoans, uh, things which all eumetazoans share, are things like muscles and nervous system. So things that are pretty fundamental to the way uh, we live our lives and insects get around. Uh, sponges have precursors to those characters, but they don't have them. They haven't evolved along um, in evolutionary history at that point. So Frankie and her international team, including colleagues from across the UK and Russia, have shown that Charnia, found and first described from the rocks of Charnwood Forest, is not only an animal, but is a specific type of animal known as a eumetazoan. Now, final question, Frankie, why does this matter? What does this tell us about the world that we live in? What does this tell us about Earth history? What's, what's the, what's, why is it so important that, that this ediacaran organism was a eumetazoan? Well, from a scientific perspective, uh, as I've mentioned ad nauseum, we've not known what Charnia and its relatives are for a really long time. Um, and I hope, if I'm correct, this goes some way to addressing this outstanding paleontological mystery. But um, I guess it's important for us to know for a number of reasons. Firstly, curiosity. I think we all want to know where we came from. And it's really cool and interesting if um, the fossils which show us what some of our earliest ancestors would have looked like are just on our doorstep. Um, and secondly, it can tell us about how the characters which have come to define the eumetazoa evolved through time. So we might expect, for example, that to develop muscles and nervous system, you have to have uh, like a pretty consistent way of growing and developing. That makes intuitive sense, doesn't it? If you're growing in all different ways, uh, like sponges, um, you can't really develop muscles or a, a complex nervous system. And what we see in Charnia for the first time is a constrained pattern of growth. So what I mean by that is you can go out and you can find any Charnia in the world, and there are many different sites where Charnia is found, um, and it will look pretty much the same. So you can see here these branches are pretty consistent in length all the way up. We don't ever find Charnias with branches that are way too long or way too short, and the outline of the frond is predictable based on the size of the organism, so it has a constrained pattern of growth, but no evidence for muscles or a nervous system yet. So what that might suggest um, is that a constrained pattern of growth does indeed predate these, these organ-based characters, um, which is so important in the radiation of eumetazoan life, which happened after the appearance of Charnia. Wonderful, wonderful news, and we are so proud that this has come from rocks and specimens from the Charnwood Forest Geopark. If you want to find out more, Frankie, your, you and your team, you've published this in the scientific press. Just remind us, which, what journal is it in? Science Advances, and it's open access. Open access, so anyone can go on to Science Advances and find out this wonderful story. Thank you so much, Frankie. Pleasure. Apologies there, looks like we had a few connection problems. We'll bring in back the uh, UNESCO 
programs and external relations committee it should be said that 24 member states 24 have asked to speak on the proposal currently being discussed this is the commission is currently discussing unesco and the ocean and we can see the the representative of the russian federation is talking um some of these have been quite short uh, it should be said that the delegate from spain gave a master class in a short snappy 30 second point on why they were supporting uh, the proposal but there are 24 so we might expect this to go on for some time yet um her royal highness princess haifa al mogrin of the kingdom of saudi arabia in the chair has asked delegates to stick to two minutes in their speeches but still we might expect this to go on for perhaps 30 to 40 more minutes at least on agenda item number 29 unesco and the ocean remember if you would like to find out more if you if you have been tantalized by our coverage of today's events from unesco and you want to understand more about the procedures and processes of the politics and all the lovely discussions that go on in unesco then go to your preferred online search engine and search for unesco executive board and that will take you to the website where you can find all the information the agenda and all the documents being discussed today in all six of the official languages of the united nations english french spanish arabic chinese and russian just a reminder we're bringing you live coverage here of the unesco executive board discussions from Paris. My name's Jack Matthews. I'm Geo Heritage Interpretation and Conservation Officer here at the Charmwood Forest Aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark in the United Kingdom. We're watching a live feed from UNESCO HQ in Paris and we're in the Programs and External Relations Commission as we are waiting for the first discussion of the eight new UNESCO Global Geoparks um as we've been saying they will first be debated today hopefully if the timetable holds in the program and external relations commission um representatives of the unesco executive board will vote on it within that commission and then uh, that proposal will go forward for a final vote in the plenary session next wednesday the 13th of April. So while if there is any debate, and we don't expect a lot of debate on this, the preparatory group of the executive board has recommended that the proposal for eight new geoparks as put forward by the Global Geopark Council, who met last December, um, the preparatory group has recommended there is no debate on the proposal. But what will what tends to happen is that on agenda items with no debate the delegates will simply vote straight away uh, on whether they are going to approve and it would be quite unusual if they didn't approve it um, and then usually some members take the floor to make a short speech and we might expect that those people taking the floor would be those nations uh, with some of the new geoparks so that will happen today but they won't become new geoparks very confusing procedure and that's why we're here to help guide you through this process today um live on the charmwood forest uh facebook and youtube feeds we're going to guide you through the discussion today and then we'll come back next week next wednesday for the final approval and at that moment eight new UNESCO geoparks will be declared and we are very much looking forward to celebrating that with those countries and those regions 
from all around the world. Here we can see the distinguished delegate from China, uh, from Kenya, sorry, who is speaking on the proposal agenda item 29 UNESCO and the ocean. It looks like we might be in for a long call here today, people. Lots of representatives wanting to discuss the agenda items this morning already. Some agenda items left over from yesterday afternoon into this morning's agenda as well. So we're running behind. It could be that the point on UNESCO Global Geoparks is pushed to this afternoon. What will happen is um, the meeting stops quite promptly at 1 p.m. Paris time. Um, it should be noted, uh, you may have noted when we've tuned in to the audio that, of course, this has to be uh, live translated into the six different languages. We're today tuning in to the English feed from the room one of UNESCO because of that. And it's quite tiring work. There's, they're quite strict on the timing. And so they will stop at 1 p.m. so that the live translators and indeed the rest of the secretariat doing the live text translations and all the other support from the re me meeting can stop and get a very well-deserved lunch. And it, and it should be said that the diplomats uh, love a good stop for lunch. It's an opportunity to meet with other member states from around the world and have important discussions, important discussions that haven't been so easily done online in the past two years. So in Paris time, the meeting will stop between 1 and 3 p.m. Um, and then the meeting will come back. At that point, they were meant to be discussing SDG 4 on Education 2030, Global Regional Coordination and Support. They were then going to move on to Problems and Development Prospects of the UNITWIN UNESCO Chair Programs and the UNESCO Strategy for Technical and Vocational Education and Training. However, it strikes me that it could be possible that some of the motions from this morning could get pushed into this afternoon. If that happens, we will create another live feed and we will be bringing you everything that happens. We're not going to miss this important uh, step forward for eight new geoparks from around the world. Now, we will just have to wait and see. It has been known for a chair of the executive board, the commission, or indeed the commissions of the general conference to move agenda items around at last minute to better use up the time that they have. However, while we still probably have at least 20 minutes, at least on this agenda item, we'll bring you some more information on some of the other things going on in Charmwood Forest, in geoparks, and indeed in geodiversity from all around the world. Viewers may be familiar with the recent declaration of a UNESCO International Geodiversity Day. This was first approved by the UNESCO Executive Board this time last year before going on to the UNESCO General Conference um, at the end of last year, where it was finally approved in November, meaning that on October the 6th every year will be the official UNESCO International Geodiversity Day. Um, and this will be an opportunity every year to celebrate the wonders of geodiversity. Now, you may be asking, what is geodiversity and why is it so important? And to help you with that, we've got a wonderful video made by some fellow enthusiasts for geodiversity to explain a little bit more. Hi, I'm Katerina. Hi, I'm Lea. Hi, I'm Xenia. We all work in Oikon, Institute of Applied Ecology, and we are coming from Zagreb, from Croatia. All biological and landscape diversity is based on geodiversity. It's an inseparable part of nature without human influence. 
geological and geomorphological phenomena contribute to the diversity of the landscape and make it special and recognizable. Geolocations are part of the geosphere with special significance for understanding its development and present-day features. Studying geology through time facilitates understanding of current Earth processes. Once geological features are degraded, they cannot be recovered. By managing natural capital sustainably and by focusing on natural-based solutions, we are protecting geodiversity for a long term. The importance of that conservation is emphasized in UN SDGs. While protecting geological values, we are empowering biodiversity conservation. That's because geodiversity enables formation of different habitats, which are the basis for diversification of ecological niches. That's why geodiversity deserves an international day. That was a wonderful video by our friends at OICON, um, the Institute of Applied uh, Ecology, I believe it was. Um, a wonderful video promoting the importance of geodiversity. I should say those of you that are tuning in live, of course, you'd be able to see the recording of this if you want to trawl through our wonderful guide through how the inner sanctums of UNESCO work. But those of you joining live, We'd love to hear where you are joining us live from. Do pop a, uh, a mention in the comments of either Facebook or YouTube live streams. Do pop that in. We'd love to hear where you're, who you are, where you're joining us from today. And of course, if you have any questions, do put those in the comments too. And we'll try and respond to as many of those as possible. Now, just a reminder what's happening here today. Um, we have the UNESCO Executive Board uh, is meeting um, and we expect there to be eight new UNESCO Global Geoparks approved by the end of the Executive Board, 214th Executive Board. We expect that those eight new geoparks to be approved. Um, and those were first evaluated and then recommended by the Global Geopark Council, who met last December to uh, decide on those eight geoparks to go forwards. And the reason we are here today is that the Programme and External Relations Committee, a commission, a kind of subcommittee of the UNESCO Executive Board is meeting to discuss in detail some of the proposals. It should be said there are other commissions meeting this week too to discuss other proposals. They're grouped together by topic. And then at the end of the meeting of the Programme and External Relations Commission, a report will be written on the discussions with some draft recommendations. You'll often hear delegates speaking about the DR, that's the draft recommendation and the report and the draft recommendations will go forward to the plenary of the entire UNESCO Executive Board next week and it's only at that point on Wednesday the 13th of April that we will have eight new UNESCO Global Geoparks. A quick run through who these eight are who are all uh, slightly in anticipation for the debates and discussion. I'm sure it will absolutely sail through and go fine, but we're not quite sure when it will happen. That's one of the reasons why this live stream may turn out to be a little longer than we'd expected. And apologies for those who are tuning in for all of it, because you may hear my, me repeating myself somewhat, but we're in it now, so we'll stick with it for the long haul, whatever that may mean. So let's have a quick reminder of the eight geoparks up for approval by the UNESCO Executive Board this year. And apologies in advance to any of my terrible pronunciation or failures to remember all the details of these. But we have the Geopark Ries from Germany, which tells the wonderful story of an impact crater. I should say we'll go into more detail uh, a little bit later. And perhaps when we come back to this for the final approval in the plenary next week, we'll go into more detail about what the wonderful stories are that are told in these geoparks. But let's quickly go through them. Geopark Ries from Germany. We have the Platterbergens Geopark in Sweden, Lasswed. 
Um, the Natur Melodal Geopark, so that Melodal Geopark and Natur Park um, from Luxembourg. We also have the Buzau Land Geopark in Romania. The Sal Pozelska, I apologize to our Finnish colleagues, a wonderful geopark there. We also have the geopark of Kefalonia Ithaca from Greece. The geopark Caminos dos Canions do Sul from Brazil. And Brazil with uh, two proposals this year getting through Geopark Cerrido in the Rio Grande do Norte of Brazil as well. So two proposals coming in from Brazil this year. Um, you can see behind me, it's quite handy having those uh, clocks behind me. Um, we are joining you. It is uh, half past 10, 10.30 here in the United Kingdom, um, 11.30 for those delegates in uh, Paris. Um, so we're bringing you live coverage of the geopark discussions as happening at the UNESCO Executive Board 214th meeting here in the year 2022. And we are hoping that eight new geoparks are going to be approved. Today's the meeting, one of the meetings of the Programme and External Relations Commission. We're a bit behind schedule, but hopefully by the end of the day, we'll have the at least the approval, the recommendation of the Commission before going on to the final vote uh, next week. I can see on my screen now that we have the representative from Azerbaijan who is speaking on the proposal 29 at the moment. We're still on UNESCO and the ocean. Um, so we await more there. Um, I, I am still slightly hopeful uh, that the chair will bring forward the geopark, but this is, I'm not even sure if I can call that a prediction. I am just hoping that the proposal for geoparks will be able to leapfrog the other agendas, uh, agenda items that are down to be discussed today. So at this point, while we are still going over to the delegate from Uruguay to debate this, I think we'll hop across Let's learn a little bit more about geodiversity. That was a wonderful video there from our friends in Oikon. But let's hear a little bit more from someone you might perhaps recognize the voice of. Men will be taught that beneath and behind all the outward beauty of our lowlands, our uplands and our highlands, there lies an inner history which, when revealed, will give beauty a fuller significance and an added charm. Archibald Geeky, Landscape and Literature, 1905. Our planet is such a special place, enlivened by an incredible ecological richness of fauna and flora. But the accelerating loss of natural habitat and species mean that biodiversity is on everyone's lips. And yet, underpinning biodiversity is its hidden silent partner, geodiversity. The basis of every ecosystem are the non-living elements of nature, rocks, minerals and soils, and landforms and topography mountains, gorges, rivers and lakes. This geodiversity has its own intrinsic value worthy of protection. And it has an essential role for the human planet It provides the building stones for our towns and cities. And it provides the material for our energy resources, including renewable energy. 
So as well as underpinning biodiversity, geodiversity underpins human diversity. It's the bedrock of our national and cultural identity. The foundations of Mother Earth, our common home. That was, of course, Professor Ian Stewart there narrating a wonderful video made with thanks to the University of Nottingham, the University of Plymouth, and of course, colleagues from the Earth Sciences section of the UNESCO Secretariat, explaining why geodiversity is so important and indeed what geodiversity is, the the variety of the non-living elements of nature, so including rocks, fossils, soils, landscapes and landforms, and indeed the processes that create, modify and destroy those features. And we're very much looking forward to celebrating International Geodiversity Day later this year on October the 6th, and indeed every year after that. If you'd like to find out more, you can go along to Geodiversity Day Dot org, where you can find more information and interesting resources on why geodiversity is important and the reasons we need to raise its profile, but also information on events that are being hosted around the world and resources to help support you to run an event in your area, online and internationally. We'd love your support in making the first International Geodiversity Day a success. So go to geodiversityday.org for more information. We can see there that the delegate from Japan is speaking on the proposal on UNESCO and the ocean. We're still going through the speakers there before getting to the draft resolution. Thank you to all those who are joining us live and indeed on the recorded live stream of this event, part one of our coverage of this year's Geopark discussions at the UNESCO Executive Board. If you're joining us live, we'd love to hear who you are and where you're joining us from. Do pop your name and where you're from in the chat. And indeed, if you've got any questions, please do put them in the comments on Facebook Live or on our YouTube Live, and we will try and respond to as many of those as possible. Hopefully, we will know the answers. But if we don't, maybe we'll be able to grab a moment to find the answer for you. So today we are watching the feed coming in live from UNESCO HQ in Paris. Just a reminder that the agenda is slightly behind schedule and we don't quite know when the Geopark uh, agenda item is going to be discussed today by the Programme and External Relations Commission. It was expected to be this morning, but I will warn viewers that it is potential that this may be delayed until later today. If that is the case, we will create a new live stream after representatives of the member states of UNESCO have come back from their lunch, and we will start a new broadcast to bring you all of the debate, the discussion, and guide you through what can at times be a complicated process of the international diplomatic arena that is uh, UNESCO, the education, science and cultural organisation of the United Nations. Now, of course, we are here to celebrate UNESCO Global Geoparks. These are areas all around the world. There's around 170 all around the world now celebrating internationally significant geology and using it to promote sustainable economic development and education about different areas of our Earth history. And hopefully, by the end of UNESCO's Executive Board, 214th meeting of that next week, we will have a new 
UNESCO Global Geoparks joining us. Um, as the debate continues on agenda item 29, this is a good moment to ask, what is a geopark? And what could it mean for my area? We might have people joining in today thinking, what is a geopark and how could it assist my area? And we have a wonderful video created by the UNESCO Secretariat, advised by Oslem Adiaman, one of the brilliant staff at UNESCO. So let's watch the video, a little bit of a guide. What is a UNESCO Global Geopark? Since 1972, UNESCO has been making a contribution to peace building and sustainable development in its member states thanks to its unique remit in earth sciences. What is a UNESCO Global Geopark? They are the most recent UNESCO site designations for protecting geological sites of international significance. The 195 members of UNESCO ratified the creation of a new UNESCO label, the UNESCO Global Geoparks, on 17th of November 2015. The decision was taken by member states at UNESCO's General Conference, the governing body of the organisation. This expressed governmental recognition of the importance of managing outstanding geological sites and landscapes in a holistic manner. As of 2021, there are 161 UNESCO Global Geoparks in 44 countries. So how do we distinguish UNESCO Global Geoparks from UNESCO World Heritage Sites and UNESCO Biosphere Reserves, which are the other two prestigious labels of UNESCO site designations? The UNESCO Global Geoparks are sites and landscapes of international geological significance as independently verified by scientific professionals. It's important that they're identified as single, unified geographical areas. They cannot be made up of separate, smaller areas within a region. They will typically have a multitude of sites of specific interest and must be contained within the designated area. Within the geopark, there will be links between the area's geological heritage and its natural, cultural, and intangible heritage. So in a region, local people will celebrate their unique geological heritage and combine those features with their rich cultural heritage, their landscape, wildlife, food, people, storytelling. Each one combined is used to promote the region's earth history. So what are the advantages of UNESCO Global Geoparks for UNESCO member states? A UNESCO Global Geopark uses its geological heritage in connection with all other aspects of the area's natural and cultural heritage to enhance awareness and understanding of key issues facing society, such as using our planet's resources sustainably, reducing the impact of natural disasters, mitigating the effects of climate change. The key to solving these issues is that the UNESCO Global Geoparks should use that heritage in connection with all other aspects of that area's natural and cultural heritage to promote awareness of key issues facing society in the context of the dynamic planet we all live in, including, but not limited to, increasing knowledge and understanding of geoprocesses, geohazards, climate change, the need for the sustainable use of Earth's natural resources, the evolution of life, and the empowerment of indigenous peoples. They'll be managed with a holistic concept of protection, education, and sustainable development. The creation of innovative local enterprises, new jobs, and high quality training courses is stimulated as new sources of revenue are generated through geotourism, whilst the geological resources of the area are protected. By raising awareness of the importance of the area's geological heritage in history and society today, UNESCO Global Geoparks give local people a sense of pride in their region and strengthen their identification with the area.
If you would like to become part of UNESCO's Global Geoparks family, please contact us. That was, of course, uh, Professor Ian Stewart once more narrating a video on what is a UNESCO Global Geopark and all the wonderful facets of those very special places as we await news of the first debate from this year's UNESCO Executive Board. I shouldn't say this year's because, of course, there are multiple meetings of the Executive Board. This is the 214th session of the UNESCO Executive Board. There we can see the delegate from the Republic of Korea. Um, we are still on agenda item 29 on the UNESCO and the ocean. We're moving over to the delegate from Iceland and we are waiting to hear when the debate will begin, or rather not debate, discussion on UNESCO global geoparks. Let's just review the agenda uh, once more, we're waiting for agenda item number nine. They don't follow in order, it should be said. So we're currently on agenda item 29. And then if the ordering as provided on the agenda continues, it will be 27, 25, and then nine. If you want to know more about the information, the documents all behind today's proposals, please do search on your favorite search engine, UNESCO Executive Board, and that will take you through in your preferred one of the six official languages of the United Nations, English, French, Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, and Russian. You can get all the information in your preferred language. Um, we are once more going back to the distinguished delegate from Togo, a great supporter of Earth Sciences, it should be said, raising the point of Earth Sciences education and the need for that and the good work that UNESCO has been doing on Earth Sciences education in Africa in his plenary speech a few days ago. We are live from Paris. The time there is 11.47, 10.47 here in the United Kingdom as we are covering the UNESCO Programs and External Relations Commission as we await the first discussion of UNESCO Global Geoparks. Thanks to all those who are joining us live and indeed recorded from around the world. Um, if you are joining us live, we'd love to hear who you are and where you're joining us from. So if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube live, please do pop your name in the chat and uh, in the comments and we'd love to hear who you are and where you are from. Um, apologies that we're not sticking to schedule, but this is out of my hands. We are simply viewers of the events as they take place uh, from UNESCO HQ in Paris. While we await the end of Agenda Item 29 on UNESCO and the ocean, let's consider a little bit more about geodiversity why it's so important and why it was so important that UNESCO declare a UNESCO International Geodiversity Day. Of course, there is already an International Biodiversity Day. There's now an International Day of the uh, UNESCO Biosphere Reserves. There's, Internet, there's Earth Day. There are many different days for the uh, living parts of nature. But the geodiversity, the non-living elements of nature, rocks, soils, fossils, uh, landscapes, and the processes that make, modify, and destroy those have somewhat been overlooked for some time. And yet they have a huge impact, not only on the rest of the natural world, but also on our society. And are incredibly important for us to achieve the sustainable development goals as set by the United Nations. So if you would like to be involved in Geodiversity Day, it's open to everyone. Please do look to geodiversityday.org. But to uh, give you a little bit of an explainer about why geodiversity is so important and why we have pushed so hard for an International Geodiversity Day, here's a little video that we put together a few months ago that explains a little bit more about why we actually need an International Geodiversity Day. 
Geodiversity is all around us, from rocks and soils to the landscapes and processes that make them. My name's Jack Matthews and I'm a geologist from the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. And in these videos, I want to tell you about geodiversity, what it is and why it's so important. The United Nations has been spearheading a campaign called the Sustainable Development Goals. These 17 goals are the bedrock to a new, more sustainable future. One that is more equitable, one that is greener and healthier, and hopefully more peaceful. Now, geodiversity plays an important role in many, if not all, of these 17 sustainable development goals. Whether it's clean water for communities around the world, or securing the copper we need to build the wind turbines for green energy, or protecting our landscapes so that the next generation can enjoy nature it would be easy to think that geodiversity is just about really important, internationally significant sites, World Heritage Sites and UNESCO Global Geoparks. But geodiversity is everywhere and it influences everything. And so, hopefully, UNESCO will set up an International Geodiversity Day. So that for one day a year, October the 6th, the world will come together to remember the influence that geodiversity has, to educate the next generation, to inspire a new set of geoscientists to solve the problems of tomorrow, and to bring to prominence the problems and challenges around geodiversity, and maybe find a few solutions and help policymakers make the right decision. There we go, a bit more of an introduction to why geodiversity is so important in facing the challenges we have in our society. We're still waiting the end of the discussion for UNESCO and the ocean. Um, delegate from Tunisia there taking the podium to make their point. I think we're getting to the end of the 24 member states who have requested to speak on this. We might dip into uh, the debate and discussion at some point on this, but we expect that the discussion on UNESCO Global Geoparks will be slightly later than expected. Those of you who are joining us live, thank you. And um, we'd love to hear who you are and where you're from. Please do pop something into the comments. We'd love to hear where you're joining us from today. And indeed, if you have any questions, both in live or watching the recorded version, do pop those in the comment and we'll try and get back to you as quickly as we can. Of course, UNESCO can be a little bit distant, it should be said. It can be a little bit complicated. It's hard to understand the processes that are going on in UNESCO. And this is one of the reasons why we're bringing you this live stream today, so that we can better understand the processes that geoparks go through from their initial application as they submit it through their member state national commission to UNESCO that goes through to Paris. The application is then sent out for a desktop evaluation by expert evaluators around the world who will look into such questions as, does the geopark have 
internationally significant geology. And then, of course, that will be followed up by two experts from the UNESCO Geopark community visiting the Geopark for several days, being shown around, understanding the internationally significant geology, and also um, the way that Geoparks connect that with uh, education, other elements of their heritage, cultural heritage, natural heritage, and of course, intangible heritage as well, not to be forgotten, and use that and enmesh that within their communities. And those two evaluators will then write a report that goes on to the UNESCO Global Geopark Council, which most recently met in December to make final decisions on which geoparks would be recommended and put forward to the UNESCO Executive Board, which is what we're watching now. So back in December at the Global Geopark Council, it was decided that eight geoparks will go forward to be approved, hopefully, by the UNESCO Executive Board. And the processes that work here is that first, we will see the discussion in the Programme and External Relations Commission, which is what we're watching here. And the final approval will be next Wednesday. Now, for those of you joining us live from the Charmwood Forest Geopark in Leicestershire in the UK, it's worth reminding you that we are not up for um, approval this year. We are at the start of our journey, the Charmwood Forest aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark, and it will be a few years yet before we submit our dossier to UNESCO. But we thought we'd take a moment to help explain the processes that geoparks have to go through. And as I've said, UNESCO can be slightly difficult to understand. Apologies to people watching. I'm halfway through chewing a biscuit. Um, got to stay uh, well, uh, well fed in these long live streams. Um, so UNESCO can be a difficult process and as can any national or international parliamentary procedure. So we thought we would bring you this live stream to just gently guide you through the processes that are happening. I can see we've got people joining us live from all around the world, but I'm very pleased to see that we've got Anne Irving uh, and her lovely dog there from uh, Woodhouse, one of the absolutely beautiful villages in Charmwood Forest, nestled among the unexpected upland of Britain, amongst the beautiful countryside of Leicestershire. At that point, while we are still on the agenda item 29, UNESCO and the ocean, um, let's once more consider why is it why is Charmwood Forest so spectacular? What geological heritage has it got, but also what has it got broader? We in Charmwood Forest in Leicestershire cover three local councils, um, Hinckley and Bosworth, Northwest Leicestershire, and Charnwood Borough. So we cut across a number of institutions, uh, 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 local authority institutions, and one of them, Charmwood Borough, have just released their new promotional video. It's called Discover Charmwood, and we are very pleased that some very important sites within our geopark feature very prominently in this, and if, if you look very carefully at the logo there, you might recognise that it reflects one of our very famous fossils from Charnwood, Charnia. You can see the branching pattern of Charnia in that logo. Charnia, of course, being one of the oldest animal fossils in the world from around 560 million years ago. But don't take it from me. See, as we await the geopark discussion, let's just check in to discover Charnwood and why Charnwood is such a wonderful place to visit. It's time to discover Charnwood. Perfectly located right in the centre of the country and enjoying superb transport links, there is no better place to visit, work and live. For nearly 600 million years, the powerful forces of nature have been sculpting our breathtaking landscapes. 
Evidence of our unique geological history is scattered among picturesque villages and can be experienced up close in the rocks of Bradgate Park and Beacon Hill. Such is the importance of Charnwood Forest, it is now an aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark. At the heart of this dramatic landscape is the dynamic university and market town of Loughborough, home to the last major bell foundry in the UK, 800-year-old markets and the Great Central Heritage Railway. Future. Our award-winning Loughborough University and cutting-edge science and enterprise parks are leading world-class research, innovation and sport, and nurturing the stars and heroes of future generations. Discover Charnwood, a fascinating destination promising a non-stop voyage from ancient origins to future potential. In Charnwood, we are shaping tomorrow's world today. That was a wonderful video made by Charnwood Borough Council, um, bringing you some of the wonderful sites that are available in Charnwood Borough, which represents part of the Charnwood Forest aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark. I believe we might be coming to the end of the debate on UNESCO and the Ocean Agenda item 29. Um, as we can see now that we're, the camera is trained on the observers. These are member states of, you know, usually member states of UNESCO who are not elected members of the executive board. They still get a moment to make their points on the agenda items being discussed. Apologies to those viewers who are catching me looking side to side. I've got a number of screens on today. We're trying to keep abreast of all the information as it happens live from Paris and indeed elsewhere in the Geopark world. Let's just tune in for a moment to hear the chair. And uh, there has been a good number of questions being asked. Um, I would like to give the floor first to the distinguished representative of Egypt, especially to elaborate more about uh, Alexandria and Sharm el Sheikh. Uh, uh, event and maybe another things that you, you will be able to uh, elaborate on before I give you the floor. Please go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, with your permission, would it be acceptable that uh, the ADG speaks first before uh, before us? Sure, no problem. So you have the floor, please. There's a number of questions that were uh, not only yes. about the Alexandria, and I've seen you writing them all. So, I, um, and we have we have also recorded them. If uh, there's any more, I will want to ask you. So, please go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, you know, of course, uh, we are overwhelmed with, with that support. We had uh, uh, 28 members of uh, executive board and three observers speaking, 31 uh, countries. And you know, uh, and I think that think that everyone loves the IOC uh, and the ocean. Thank you so much for that. So, uh, you know, I'd like also to say that uh, in the text of the resolution, there are occasions when uh, the word oceans is, is, is mentioned. You know, uh, it is very important to recognize that we have one ocean on our planet. Uh, and... Uh... So, viewers tuning in now, um, what is happening is the member states of UNESCO have uh, voiced their thoughts on the proposal for UNESCO and the ocean. And we're now going back. Some of them have uh, asked questions as part of their debate. Um, so we're now looking at the representative of the direct general, um, the direct general being the leader of UNESCO, the, the leadership position within UNESCO elected by the member states. And I believe the representative here, I may be wrong, I'm going slightly from memory here, I believe this is the head of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, the IOC, which is formerly part of UNESCO, and it first met in Paris at the UNESCO headquarters in October of 1961. This is the head of the IOC who is representing the Director General and responding to the points 
of delegates. The reason the camera went briefly to Egypt is they are the proposer of the draft recommendation on UNESCO and the ocean. Um, and so we are just waiting to hear a little more. Let's tune back in to see what the distinguished representative of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission has to say in response to the points raised. Is, uh, of, of the planet is, is the ocean and 2% of UNESCO budget. I always speak that and it resonates, I think, with, with ambassadors. So it, it will be important for us to translate programmatic recommendations of decision to uh, activities of IOC, and this will be done by speaking to IUC governing bodies, because we have functional autonomy, and usually um, member states of UNESCO define the budget, and IUC member states see how we can use that budget to maximize the work in the ocean. So I would like also to, to, to thank uh, uh, Non-IUC member states, Hungary and Armenia, who spoke about this. You spoke about landlocked countries, uh, uh, and um, and uh, some of some of you spoke at least, and also I know that Latvia is not a member state of IOC, also supported the resolution. So first of all, indeed, under United Nations Convention Law of the Sea, the rights of landlocked countries are clearly stated, and IOC is working for those countries. I invite you to join IOC. Please do. So, you know, we, uh, we started with 40 countries, and now we have only five uh, countries in the world that are not member states, so we see that they have a cost. But, you know, we have potential. But if you come, please participate. That is also important. So, you know, uh, human relation with the ocean, that was mentioned, and I think it's a very important thing. This is a part of the decade. In order to live better, in order to be better humans, we need to recognize the role of the ocean, and this is an ethical dimension that we are going to uh, pursue particularly through the ocean literacy component. So when you can protect only when what you love and what uh, you can love only what you know. So relations with many organizations were mentioned here, including International Hydrographic Organization. So we are going to have a discussion on how to, we can move forward on the project, which is called JEPCA. JEPCA, General Bathymetric Chart of the Ocean. It was started by Monaco when Prince Albert I in 1903. Uh, in order to map the ocean. In 19, in, in, uh, and so, 1903. In 2015, we had 5% of the ocean area covered by a de decent resolution data. So, 5% in more than 100 years. In five, six years, by collecting data, we'll be able to generate more than 20%. This is a huge task ahead of us to map the ocean because this is really important for uh, prediction of tsunami, for prediction of climate, uh, and many other things. But we have to do it politically correctly. I agree with uh, Santa Lucia. So, successes of organizations are measured sometimes by good publications, increased budget, and, and many other things, good conferences. You know, I think IUC is creating something that is uh, more important than that. We are creating conditions uh, for using science to save the ocean. And the approach to this goes through sustainable ocean management on the basis of sustainable ocean planning. A key element of this is 100% of managing exclusive economic zones. This is happening now with 16 countries. And the decade is, uh, of ocean science is the vehicle to engage science into enabling management of, uh, of, of, of the ocean space. Uh, indeed, climate is in incredibly important, mentioned by several countries. So uh, we have new understanding how we can organize the work in the ocean in order to address elements of climate change. Carbon, carbon balance. Uh, oceans consumes uh, carbon, but uh, the capacity will uh, diminish in the future. So we are going to increase the effort to study carbon those solutions in the domain of mitigation of climate change, sequestration of carbon. We all discussed this at the recent meeting of the Decade Advisory Board that took place last week, and there are some ideas how we can make it. This is saving life and making the, the, the planet habitable. You know, discussions of tsunami, indeed, we are going to step up the tsunami warning system in the world, saving lives of people. And we are going to work uh, 24 hours a day. This is system uh, works like a warning system around the clock, and there are uh, in ambitions, and I really call on you all, please help us to, to uh, move forward the Tsunami Ready program, a part of the IUC Tsunami program, so that 100% of communities that are under risk of tsunami are 
ready for to uh, react on, on, on the warnings. So I would like also to say that division of labor is emerging within UNESCO and within the United Nations. IOC is more recognized as the source of science that is underpinning a lot of activities, including activities related to establishment of scientifically valid marine protected areas. The same true is true in UNESCO. IOC science observations help other sectors to work better in the domains of uh, underwater cultural heritage in this in uh, running uh, world heritage sites uh, biospheric reserves. Special attention uh, is paid by C to seeds, and the uh, seeds are a higher priority in IOC. I would say, sorry for this, maybe politically wrong statement, but you know, seeds are very high priority in uh, NOC in the medium term strategy. Very special group, and we're working with seeds, uh, focusing definitely on tsunami, on many other things as well. So, seeds are small island developing states be very serious discussions how to step up this 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 work so what the cook islands proposed was very important but i see also has several sub commissions and uh and all of them you know we have we are paying attention not only to the core kind on of, that's really core but you know the, the 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 kind of land part but also adjacent states so all i see sub commissions focus on this so we have these four subcommissions. We are stepping up the work also in the Indian Ocean that includes all small island developing states. I thank Hungary for the interest in the work of, of IOC and proposal regarding to uh, re regarding IHP. Indeed, under the decade, uh, recently we considered a, a, a proposal for a program that is focusing on source to sea. So that is, I think, a fantastic opening. Uh, Thank you for those joining us live for this Geopart Live special of coverage of the UNESCO Executive Board as we await the first discussion, hopefully seeing the proposal of eight new UNESCO global geoparks to join the nearly 170 from around the world that already exist. We are waiting for the agenda items um, that are running before the global geoparks item on the agenda. We're a bit behind time. Perhaps that's why the gentleman behind the representative of the IOC is leaning on his hand, slightly tired. But we will persevere. We will bring you everything as it happens. While we are waiting for the discussion uh, to continue on uh, the various agenda items today, we thought we'd tell you a little bit more about the Charmwood Forest Geopark what it is, where it is, and why it's so important, and why we're so keen to also join the club of UNESCO Global Geoparks, and hopefully we'll be submitting our application in a few years' time. Now, the Charmwood Forest UNESCO Global Geopark is located in the centre of the United Kingdom. You can see the star there, just sitting uh, northeast of Birmingham, the second city of the United Kingdom. And more specifically, it's around 150 square kilometres between the city of Leicester, the town of Loughborough, and the town and villages running down the western side, such as Colville. Um, so wonderful, wonderful area of countryside between these various areas. And we recognise in Charmwood Forest that this is a very, very special area. And if we don't promote greater understanding of the significance of this area, then we can't protect it. We follow the motto that you can't protect, you can't conserve what you don't understand. So we're bringing to prominence the reasons why this area is so important. And a huge, huge part of that is geology. Or, and in many ways, the geology underpins the other reasons why it's so important. And on geology and geodiversity, let's skip ahead to see some of the geodiversity of this area. There's another map of the area, roads in black there. We have Britain's first motorway, uh, the M1, cutting right through the middle of it. It does mean that our area is very accessible. You can see the boundary there in, uh, I'm gonna make that a little bit bigger. You can see the boundary there in uh, uh, dashed green, uh, and you can see there the towns and cities of Colville, Loughborough, and Leicester. And within there, you can see various block colours. Now, I haven't coloured in the Triassic. I've left that white because the geology of the Triassic is the most dominant um, in terms of uh, subcrop 
uh, in the area. But we also have cropping out within the Charmond Forest Geopark, Ediacaran, Cambrian, Ordovician, Carboniferous, Triassic, and Quaternary. Quaternary representing the last around about three million years of Earth history. But for us, our most internationally significant rocks are those in the Ediacaran. The Ediacaran is the most recently named geological period in the geological time scale. It runs from around 635 to 540 million years ago. And there are only around about 100 sites in the world where you can see Ediacaran rocks that contain fossils. Now, 100 might sound like a lot, but uh, it's actually not much when you consider how much rock there is out there. And, you know, if we were to look at the number of sites, you could go and see Jurassic uh, fossils. It would be much, much higher than that. And one of the things that we're most proud of is the fossils that were found here in Charmwood Forest in those Ediacaran rocks from around 560 to 570 million years ago. These rocks were initially thought to be too old to contain fossils. Uh, in the late 1950s, all Precambrian rocks in the world were thought to be too old to contain fossils. Uh, but that story internationally changed here in Charmwood Forest when in the late 1950s, the fossil Charnia was discovered. I think I've got a slide. There we go. You can see there on the left, Charnia masonite. It's about 21 centimetres long and can be seen in the Leicester Museum in the city of Leicester, where we now know that it represents the oldest evidence of animal life. It can also be seen it and its orangiomorph uh, relations can be seen not only in the UK, but also in Australia, Canada, China and Russia. So a discovery that first happened in Charmwood Forest and led to a kind of paleontological gold rush around the world as people realised that the Precambrian could contain fossils, that the story of the evolution of life was different than we thought. And that shift in opinion started here in Charmwood Forest. And it means that if you want to understand that transition from what we now know is the Precambrian world, mostly dominated by microbial life, and we now know that life stretches back much further, around 3.5 billion years ago, but around about the time that we see in the oldest rocks of Charmwood Forest, we see a transition, a change from the microbial world of billions and billions of years to the animal filled world we now know today. And if you want to understand why that change happened and what happened during that shift from a microbial to an animal world, then Charmwood Forest is absolutely one of the best places in the world to go and see that, as well as other sites such as the Discovery UNESCO Global Geopark in Canada, where you can see fossils of a very similar age that indeed include Charnia, first named from Charmwood Forest. I will keep telling you about the geology of Charmwood Forest because I can see that the distinguished delegate from representative of the Inter Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission is continuing to speak on the agenda item. So let's learn a little bit more about the geology of Charmwood Forest while we are waiting because our story is not just about the Ediacaran. We have representative uh, rocks of many other geological periods too. It should be said that for an area of only 150 square kilometres, which is relatively small for a UNESCO Global Geopark, there we have quite a lot of geodiversity when you consider the different rock types we have and the ages that those represent. Our Cambrian rocks contain some very old evidence of trace fossils. They were originally thought to be pre-Cambrian as well, but a discovery in the 1990s showed that these were actually Cambrian as they contain a trace fossil known as Tychicnus, which is a representative of burrowing vertically down into the sediment, which is a textbook sign that you're not in the Precambrian, you are indeed in the Phanerozoic, which represents the most recent 540 million years, and more specifically than the Phanerozoic, 
the first and oldest period of that, the Cambrian. So you can see that in some small yellow areas on the map there on the screen. We also have an Ordovician story. It's slightly different than our Cambrian rocks. Our Ordovician story is in the east. You can see it to the south of the Loughborough sign there on our map. And that tells the story of the Caledonian orogeny. This is an event where different separate parts of Britain were slammed together to build the Britain that we know today. And when this happened, some magma was intruded into the crust. This is when liquid molten rock is inserted into the crust, but it doesn't make its way all the way to the surface to make a volcano. And therefore what happens is that molten material cools as a big blob. And after further tectonic movements, sometimes that can be revealed at the surface as it was in the eastern side of Charnwood Forest. And that's why we see the Ordovician Mount Sorrel Granodiorite. This is a very hard rock similar to a granite and is often referred to as a granite, but to igneous petrologists who are specialists in this area of geology, they prefer to call it a granodiorite. And that dates from the Ordovician around 450 million years ago. And that is quarried to this day. It's been quarried for over 200 years in the Charmwood Forest Geopark. And we are very proud to tell the story of the mining and quarrying history of so many rock types within our area, including the Mount Sorrel Granodiorite. Um, it continues to be quarried at Mount Sorrel Quarry um, and is an important strategic geo resource for the United Kingdom. 50% of the UK's network rail ballast comes from that one hole in the ground. So if you're on a train in the United Kingdom, if you look at the stone that is around the tracks, there's a kind of 50-50 chance that that comes from Mount Sorrel Quarry in the Charmwood Forest Geopark. And you're seeing 450 million year old Ordovician Grano diorite. The story doesn't end there though. Let's go a little bit younger and we can see rocks that are Carboniferous in age. And they're right on the other side of the geopark in the northwest. And you can just see on the screen there a little bit of this purpley blue color right in the northwest of our geopark. Now, most of what you can see there are uh, rocks that don't properly outcrop, they're buried under quaternary deposits um, and they represent the coal measures. So that is why some of the communities on the western side of our geopark have a rich coal mining heritage. And this is a story we will also be highlighting in our geopark and through our dossier application to UNESCO. Um, but a very particular Carboniferous deposit we have because you can find uh, coal deposits all across the UK, but we're very proud just to the east of those. You can see a small red dot on the northern boundary of our geopark. Um, that is a Grace Dew, an absolutely stunning and beautiful piece of countryside. And there is a very small outcrop of Carboniferous limestone representing the most southeasterly point that the Carboniferous limestone uh, can be found in the central province. A very important point where the shallow seas were butting up against what was still an upland back then. Uh, and so it's very important for our understanding both of the Carboniferous seas and the paleogeography at this time. It's protected as a site of special scientific interest because of its geological importance, as are so many of our sites within Charmwood Forest. And indeed, you can see not only the block colours on our map there, but also the boundary areas as well. Um, those represent our legal designations, representing sites of special scientific interest, nat national nature reserves, local nature reserves, country parks and other designations showing that even though 
our area represents less than 10% of the ceremonial county of Leicestershire. We have nearly half of the county's designated biological and geological sites, and we're very proud to have all of those in our area. Um, the Permian, going a little bit younger still, plays an important role in our geopark, but one where we don't actually see any rocks from it. Actually, we see the absence of rocks of the Permian in our geopark, because during this period, the area would have been greatly eroded. It sat at the centre of the Paleocontinent, Pangaea, and there would it would have been generally quite warm and windy with flash floods, and our area would have been um, that great upland again, featuring erosion. And during this time, all the rocks that existed before the Permian were eroded into craggy hills and mountains. So mainly those pre-Cambrian, very hard pre-Cambrian rocks were eroded into craggy hills and mountains. Following that in the Triassic, very similar environments, but we finally start to see rather than erosion, some products of deposition. And so in the valleys that were created during the Permian, we start to see deposition of rich red Triassic deposits, siltstones and sandstones representing windblown dust in these deserty environments and pebbles and sand left by flash floods that would have happened in these Triassic deposits some 240 million years ago. And they're filling in the valleys between the craggy hills. And what's very interesting is those valleys are where the valleys are today. And the crags that were crags and craggy hills uh, it, back in the Permian more than 250 million years ago are where the craggy hills are today in Charmwood. So our landscape it is evolving, but it's also repeating itself. One of the wonderful stories of the Charmwood Forest uh, aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark. And let's not forget the Quaternary story as well, which has continued to sculpt, carve and modify the beautiful, stunning landscapes of the Charmwood Forest. Un uh, aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark, we can see rich deposits from the most recent 2.6 million years. That is, the, I believe, the definition of the Quaternary. And we can see those in the fields as we walk around our stunning landscape. And most uh, clearly in the pebbles we find in those fields, because not only can we find pebbles of rocks that we find in the areas that have been picked up and deposited by glaciers during the last glacial maximum, during what we in Britain call the Anglian stage. We can find rocks from the Ediacaran and Cambrian specifically. Um, we also find rocks from the Cretaceous and the Jurassic. And as you can see from our map, we don't get those within the geopark. So they've clearly been transported from the north and the east by those glaciers during the most recent 2.6 million years. So we've got nearly 600 million years worth of uh, geology in our geopark. And we are excited to be sharing that not only with our local communities, but with people in the UK and all around the world. Now, out of the corner of my eye, I can see that representatives of member states in the meeting today are getting to the end of their discussion on UNESCO and the ocean. So I'm going to take us back over to the discussion there. And it looks like they have got onto the point where they are discussing the draft recommendation. You may hear delegates refer to this as the DR. And we'll go through a few of these in however many uh, agenda items that ends up being before we get to what we're all waiting for, the discussion on the UNESCO Global Geoparks. But we'll go through a few of these as it'll allow you to better understand how UNESCO works. We can see there that we have the representative of the Dominican Republic who is making a speech. What will be happening now is the chair has called up the draft resolution. Draft resolutions are always discussed and presented live in both English and French. And delegates have to be happy with both of those 
when they are voting on, which means when an amendment is proposed to one of them, it has to be live translated into the other as the discussion is going on. And it should be said, it is quite a sight to behold seeing the very hardworking staff at UNESCO live translating the proposed amendments from member states as it happens so that they can have the discussion in both languages at the same time. So you can see you have two members of staff here, one maintaining the French text, which we can see on the left hand side there, one maintaining the right hand text. And as you can see, the representative of the Dominican Republic is proposing an amendment in English um, which is being live translated by the member of staff into the French version on the left hand side. So that has been proposed. It will be typed into the document there. So they want to add that as well as calling for the intensification of international efforts aimed at the protection of the seas and oceans from the effects of climate change, they also wanted to add that extra clause um, establishing um, and I can't see it now because they've scrolled away. But this is the joys of live presentation of political discussions. Um, and you can see here pretty typical discussions as they go on. Uh, draft resolutions often refer to uh, previous discussions that have happened. You can tell now that because they are highlighting and scrolling down, the chair um, is taking uh, the debate one paragraph at a time, checking that delegates are happy. And once they once a paragraph is accepted, it can't be gone back to. And what you'll often find is a delegate might have uh, forgotten that they wanted to oppose something in a paragraph and they attempt to go back and they're usually not allowed to do so. So here we have um, a, I believe it's the permanent representative of uh, Chile proposing an amendment to paragraph four. So it goes in in blue, uh, taking out and capacity building and adding in and transfer of marine technology. So encouraging international cooperation within the auspices of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. And as you can see, again, those amazing staff are live translating that into French. That appears to have been accepted. Um, they're now moving through this really rather quickly, though it should be said that the discussion uh, on this agenda item has gone on for quite a lot longer than we expected. We are now probably almost three hours behind where we are expecting. Sorry to those of you who are joining us live and especially those people from the eight geoparks waiting to hear the discussion and debates on uh, their very hard worked proposals that they've spent years working on. But it looks like you are going to have to wait a, a little bit longer um, while we see the proposals to UNESCO and the ocean. The representative from Chile is proposing in Spanish and then they are taking the live translations, the live audio translations of there, and they wish to add something in about the Sustainable Development Goal, SDG Sustainable Development Goal 14.3 related to ocean acidification. It should be said that um, uh, geodiversity plays a role in our understanding of SDG 14.3. It's one of the brilliant examples of why geodiversity is important to achieving the sustainable development goals. It's one of the examples we give on geodiversityday.org. And if you'd like to discover more about that, please do go on to geodiversityday.org and learn more about why, how our understanding of the sustainable development goals will help us in challenges such as remedying the problems of ocean acidification. The time is just past half past 11 UK time, 12.30 in Paris, where UNESCO are meeting. Their meeting will end at 1 p.m. Paris time, so in about less than half an hour's time, where there'll be a two-hour break before they come back. 
We're bringing you live coverage of the UNESCO Executive Board 214th session for their discussions of the eight new UNESCO Global Geoparks. We're not quite sure when it will happen. If we do indeed go to discussion in this afternoon session, then we will start a new live stream. But we promise to guide you through the events and hopefully celebrate with the eight new geoparks. I should be stressed that when the decision is taken by the procedure, sorry, not producers, the Programme and External Relations Commission of the UNESCO Executive Board today, and hopefully it happens today and not tomorrow morning, when that happens, um, we expect uh, it to be this, uh, today or this afternoon. When that happens, that won't be the final point. And it, so you, you will not see eight new geoparks today. Rather, that proposal will go forwards to the plenary on Wednesday, the 13th of April, next Wednesday. And it is that point that there will be the final vote when the report and draft resolutions of the Programme and External Relations Commission, those will be presented to the plenary meeting. And it is the point at which those are voted on and approved that we will have eight new UNESCO global geoparks from all around the world. We have proposals from Greece, Germany, Sweden, Finland, Brazil, and I'm sure I have forgotten one, and I mean no offence to the geopark I've forgotten there, but we can review those shortly. Um, amendments are carrying on there to uh, various sections, but it seems like these amendments are being accepted by delegates very quickly and there's not being debate on them. So it seems like everyone's happy with those and they're moving through. Let's just tune in quickly to hear what's happening there live from room one of UNESCO HQ for the Programme and External Relations Commission as they discuss, hopefully come to the end of their discussions on UNESCO and the ocean. The Democratic Republic of Congo and the Dominican Republic. Can we adopt? Sure, yes, please. Thank you so much, uh, Madam uh, President. You know, I just wanted to comment on, on the, on the uh, proposal of the distinguished delegate of the Dominican Republic. You know, um, uh, recently, it was at the end of February, the United Nations Environment Assembly, its fifth edition, uh, uh, adopted uh, a, uh, a convention on uh, prohibition of single-use plastic. That adoption was the result of the science work and uh, actually IC was at the beginning of this work and there is a special group of experts called global group of experts on scientific aspects of marine uh, pollution and uh, uh, this group of experts studied uh, the, the plastic pollution and that was the basis for discussion in the whole world about uh, the, the issue that is now known by everyone so what is uh, IUC doing we are establishing variables in the global ocean observing system to measure plastic and also we establish mechanism to indicate the plastic but the thing is that verification mechanisms should be implemented under the convention and the convention is not under IUC this is a convention under the United Nations Environment Program so we cannot tell uh, the United Nations Environment Pro uh, Program uh, uh, anything to, to do. So these verification mechanisms would be, I think, a bit better positioned uh, in the UNEP. Uh, what we can reformulate very quickly this, uh, this, this paragraph so that it will be reflecting the mandate of uh, IUC of UNESCO. Well, I, I, I leave the decision to the uh, members of the board. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for this clarification. Um, um, I'll give the floor again to the uh, Dominican Republic uh, and maybe also to, to hear from other members. You have the floor. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Um, we think that this was a very timely and welcome uh, clarification, but we do think that there is one aspect uh, concerning uh, political will when it comes to decision making regarding the implementation of uh, uh, these uh, uh, plastic related uh, uh, decrees. 
I think that, uh, yes, you can reduce the incidence of uh, plastic by something like 2% by implementing this, uh, um, this rule. Forgive me, I'm sure you know the, I'm sure you know the, uh, the figures better than me, but 2% 2, 2 doesn't seem like a huge impact. But if you look at the work done by the UNESCO and the IOC uh, uh, under this proposal by UNESCO, I think perhaps what we could do is try and incentivize the sectors uh, um, in certain countries at least to, to undertake uh, restrictive measures or, or just modify the, the, their modus operandi. Because um, remember... Welcome back to our live coverage of the Programme and External Relations Commission of the UNESCO Executive Board. Representatives are currently discussing UNESCO and the ocean, and there is currently debate on... Uh, paragraph 14 of the draft resolution, the Dominican Republic have proposed a new line containing the, uh, the words by establishing verification mechanisms regarding the use of plastic and its final destination in seas and oceans. This is part of a wide ranging proposal um, being put forward and they wish to raise the profile further of the issue of single-use plastics in the oceans. The head of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission has responded that this is already incorporated to a certain extent in the uh, previous resolutions in this area, which various organisations have already taken. And it appears that the delegate from Chile is now amending the amendment from the Dominican Republic to perhaps try and find language that uh, doesn't conflict with decisions that have already been made, but uh, addresses the concerns of the Dominican Republic in wanting to further raise uh, the importance of the issue of single-use plastics within the oceans. This is a, a very characteristic example of how discussions and decision-making go on within UNESCO and the United Nations. One country will make a proposal, another may say that they don't quite agree with that, or perhaps it's already represented, and then another may try and modify it to create language uh, which everyone can be happy with. In general, they don't take votes in UNESCO, but try to build consensus, try and find language, which all member states who have voting rights, in, in this case, the member states of the UNESCO Executive Board, can be happy with. So you can see there the amazing work that's going on as representatives are debating this. Um, the various versions in English and in French are being modified live by staff and updated so that delegates are aware of what they're voting on. It looks like the delegate from Kenya was speaking there. Um, let's just go back into the room to find out what's going on. Hungary, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the floor. And of course, thank you very much for uh, ADG Revenue for, for its words. And I, uh, I mean, we will have a textual proposal actually, and I don't want really to uh, to um, to uh, to pronounce myself in, in in this statement. I mean, I'm for uh, disposal of ADG Revenue. But when we mention the cooperation between uh, IOC, uh, I mean, explicitly. And, uh, and IHP, for example, it will mention also global land-based pollution that keeps flowing from, from, from waters to the ocean. And also uh, the activity of AHP actually is, uh, has also uh, mentioned uh, uh, regarding the sources to sea approach uh, reduce uh, land and water pollution and explicitly mentions including plastic, microplastic pollution for freshwater and ocean health. So I don't know, maybe a textual version uh, could facilitate this, uh, but I'm at, at your hand and we'll propose our text at uh, para 25, after para 25. Thank you. 
Thank you. So, so at this one, it, the one that you have read is going to be in 25 as a proposal from Gary. Okay. Uh, so, uh, 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 at the request of Kenya, I would like to give you the floor to maybe uh, see how with this can uh, be, uh, you know, uh, if I can say, uh, not amended maybe, just to make it into this text and see here from the member states what they, can, they think about it. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for, for the permission to speak and also Kenya for the trust. Uh, you know, I see uh, a relatively elegant way of incorporating uh, the, the notion of pollution in the following way. Uh, the third, in the English version, the third line starts with the two words climate change. And so if we include after the words climate change, uh, from the effects of climate change and pollution, including plastics and microplastics, that probably should do the work. And then we can remove uh, the, the last part of the phrase. Thank you. So uh, the paragraph will be uh, climate change and pollution, including plastics and microplastics, as well as the preservation of their sustainability and the diversity of marine life on the basis of scientific and traditional community knowledge and stop. Uh, is that agreeable by everyone? Okay, so then we adopt paragraph four as amended. Thank you. Adopted. Paragraph 16. Do we see any comments? Do you have any comments as on the floor? I see Cook Island. You have the floor. Uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Thank you very much, Mrs. Chair. And I forgot to congratulate you for your chairwomanship. So please let me do that. Um, so we are on the paragraph 16. Huh? Um, following the debate, I would like to propose to suppress the last sentence. So let me read it for you. Um, appreciate the active contribution of UNESCO to the One Ocean Summit, including the effective participation of a director general in its high devout segment. And I would appreciate if we could suppress the rest of the sentence. Um, the reasons are um, this first. Um, I don't understand very well how we can decide on institution commitment announced, but it's not very clear which one have been announced. Um, and the second reason is actually uh, based um, on, on the explanation provided by um, Edith Givralibier. Um, I understand that uh, one of these commitments could be on the map mapping of the ocean. And we just heard that um, this mapping is actually a, a very important um, investment for the future, but it is a work in progress. Um, it's obviously very, very costly. Um, we still have doubts about the use of data. There's no safeguard. Um, and uh, politically, uh, it hasn't been approved uh, in all the instances of UNESCO. So I understand that this needs to be discussed further technically in IOC and that we have uh, interest by our members. So because it's not yet a defined and decided decision, I will think we could uh, suppress this phrase. Um, and I would like to ask IOC if by suppressing this phrase, your work will be impacted, or if it's just fine with you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to, to reflect the amendment first on the, on the text, please, in the French and English languages, if you can strike through and welcome the institutional commitment announcement. In the French as well, please. So this is the proposal by Cook Islands, uh, pending the explanation a few ADG or okay so it's okay this is your and you would like to hear from please go take the floor so, uh, this is one of my amendment that but this is not the one we were talking before I just want to be clear for maybe the uh, everybody this is a small one and then 
The one we actually had the support of a lot of countries are later on on paragraph 23, just to be clear. Yes, I know. I mean, this is clear. It's, uh, we're talking about paragraph 16, and uh, your amendment here is to strike through. And you would like to hear from ADG IOC. Um, can I, uh, if you allow me, St. Lucia and uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, based on uh, and France, uh, based on uh, the request, I would like to hear from you, ADG, and then I'll come back to you. Please, you have the floor. Vladimir. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, um, I think, you know, the work will continue, but uh, no, the, the work will continue definitely taking into account the concerns of member states. So this is, I think, for us, uh, help in the sense that, you know, it will be guiding our work uh, um, and, uh, and and I'm pretty sure that we will do a lot in, in that area. Uh, and but, but we'll do this together with partners, uh, as, as was announced. And uh, so, uh, you know, it is up to member states to decide, but you know, the work will continue in, in the proper way. So, no, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. And now uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo to be followed by uh, Santa Lucia and then France. Please, uh, you have the floor. Uh, merci, madame. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question. I just want to be sure that I've understood. Uh, in this paragraph, when it says uh, welcomes the active or appreciates the active contribution of UNESCO, this active contribution, are you talking about the presence of the Director General there? Uh, and then it says uh, um, including the effective participation. So what was UNESCO's active contribution? I'm just wondering, what did that entail? Um, because uh, I, I don't have a problem with us saying that UNESCO actively contributed, but I just wanted to know what was that. And then afterwards we say including the effective participation uh, in the discussions. So I just wanted to have that clarified because uh, maybe we just say the active contribution of UNESCO to the One Ocean Summit and stop there. Uh, and uh, strike through the, uh, including the effective participation of the Director General in its high level segment. Okay, so um, uh, I would like to give the floor to member states to hear uh, their point of view and then come back to you and maybe then the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo can present their amendment accordingly. So uh, the floor is now for uh, St. Lucia. Please, you have the floor. Yeah, Madam Chair, simply to support the proposal made by the Cook Islands with respect to the exclusion of that, of that phrase. We want to reiterate that this is not just a technical matter, but also a highly political matter. And we have had experience of people mapping the ocean floor in the OECS and monetizing it for their purposes without giving us adequate access to that information. Thank you. Thank you, noted. And we will move now to the distinguished representative of France to be followed by Philippines. And then I will give you the floor. Merci, madame. And thank you, Madam Chair. For France, it wouldn't be uh, acceptable to delete that part. Why? Because in a text on the oceans, uh, which really does uh, acknowledge the discussions that... Welcome to our live guests as we are tuning in to live scenes from the Programme and External Relations Commission of the UNESCO Executive Board in Paris. From UNESCO HQ, uh, delegates are currently discussing a agenda item on UNESCO and the ocean um, in characteristic style for UNESCO. They have delved into the minutiae of paragraph 16 and are currently debating whether a sentence at the end of paragraph 16 should be struck or not. Um, while this is going on, we are still waiting for the discussion on UNESCO Global Geoparks. They are, and that cannot happen until this has finished. Just a reminder to all those tuning in, um, this meeting will probably end in the next 10 minutes um, before delegates in Paris stop for lunch. We will then return two hours later. So it seems like 
The meeting of this commission is around three hours behind where it is expected. But whatever happens, we will bring you the debate and discussion on geoparks and guide you through the complicated world of UNESCO decision making as we hope to start the process of seeing eight new UNESCO global geoparks. Let's tune back in because although this is on UNESCO and the ocean, we may hear something from the chair um, about what's going to happen with the agenda, especially as we come up to the lunch break at 1 p.m. Paris time. Uh, with, with expressions of their satisfaction. And then, indeed, uh, the Director General participated uh, uh, in the um, in the higher level segment, speaking in front of presidents and prime ministers on the, on the role of, uh, of, 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 of UNESCO as, 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 as an organization that is involved in science matters, including ocean science. So uh, that was done, I would say, very effectively. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like now to give the floor to, to the first part of the paragraph. Uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, to the first uh, part of the paragraph, do you have any amendment or is, is the answer satisfactory? Merci, madame. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, our opinion, uh, given that it wasn't vital to uh, in, include that part of including the effective participation, but we would like to see uh, retained the active contribution of UNESCO to the One Ocean Summit, but we would still like to see the deletion of the part about the effective participation. We, we, we don't feel that that needs to be retained here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm now addressing, I'll come back to you, Grenada and Santa Lucia, with the second part. But with the first part, uh, there's an amendment now by the Democratic Republic of Congo deleting the uh, effective participation of the Director General in the high level segment. Uh, can we move along with the deletion? I see no objection, so we can delete this sentence. Egypt, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I, I, after the explanation provided by, by ADG IOC, I think that we should keep the original uh, for the first part of the paragraph uh, of it. There is a difference between the active participation, uh, the contribution, sorry, as he mentioned, and the participation. Thank you. If you wish, we can put including the high level participation so that uh, uh, if, if, if this can solve uh, someone's problem for, for the first part, I'm speaking only. Thank you. So your suggestion here, Egypt, is to uh, the active contribution of UNESCO on the ocean, uh, on the one to the one ocean summit, including the participation. Just remove the word effective. S sorry, Madam Chair. Uh, no, including the effective participation as it is, including the effective participation of the. So it is already there. Yes. Okay. Uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, you have the floor. Madame la Présidente. Madam Chair, we agree with the proposal by Egypt uh, to uh, change in the French text notamment and change it to y compris, which is closer to the... Welcome back live to the Programme and External Relations Commission of UNESCO. The delegates are currently debating paragraph 16 of the document on UNESCO and the ocean. Um, you can see that we have proposals coming in from... Democratic Republic of Congo, Egypt, St. Lucia, the Philippines, the Cook Islands and France. Some of these proposals are conflicting with each other and it is one of the great tasks of the chair of these meetings to try and encourage member states to find a middle ground that they are happy and content with. Uh, at the moment there does seem to be some conflict between the amendments that are being proposed uh, by various member states of UNESCO on this proposal and until this is resolved, unfortunately, we won't be able to progress to the other items on the agenda. So we are currently waiting to see what will happen with this paragraph on paragraph 16. Let's tune in to the representative of St. Lucia, who's a very uh, skilled and long-time representative 
uh, in the UNESCO executive board and the UNESCO system, maybe they'll be able to find some middle ground that all member states are happy with. Yes, said in the summit, we're just saying that these are things that should have been discussed with us before and that we would like to discuss before we welcome, because when we welcome, we're adopting them. At this stage, it's not going to be possible. Thank you. Vietnam, you have the floor. Well, uh, thank you, Chair. We wish to um, express our support for France for the commitments taken by DG at the One Auction Summit. Thank you. I would like to hear from the floor. Egypt, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I'm trying maybe to reach a compromise. I totally understand both point of views. Uh, I totally understand the point of view of removing uh, uh, institutional engagements announced, especially after uh, what ADG IOC had uh, said. So what I would suggest uh, in case it, uh, it can fly, uh, my understanding, but please, Mr. Rediji, confirm to me that on the 26th of April, we are going to have a meeting discussing all what happened and all what was said. Is it correct? <laughs> on the 26th of April, there will be a meeting of small island developing states. That is it on different topic. Uh, Madam Chair, if I may, I would just, uh, yeah, so, so, uh, yeah then, then so, sorry, but will there be a meeting then to, with the member states to discuss what was mentioned uh, in Brest or not? If, if yes, then in this case, what I would suggest is to remove, uh, where is the English version, and to remove uh, welcomes the institutional commitments announced to be totally removed and looks forward for the meeting of and then we are uh, of, uh, discussing the, the outcomes of the uh, uh, of the meeting uh, or, or, or any other formulation that does not include institutional commitments. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Egypt. I'd like to give the floor to the ADG just to reply on the meeting uh, that we're supposedly going to have. Yeah, many thanks, uh, ma uh, Madam Chair. Indeed, you know, there is a, a plethora of uh, meetings related to the ocean. It's very easy to get confused. So re we didn't plan to have uh, uh, a meeting uh, on specific specific, specific country, uh, 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 statements made at the One Ocean Summit. The, but very soon, there will be a meeting of the General Bathymetric Chart of the Ocean, which is statutory meeting of the program. So I think uh, it is very important that uh, concerns of member states are expressed to the statutory meetings. So this has nothing to do uh, with, with that uh, phrase that we are discussing, but it was just a, a timely opportunity to, to come back to this. So I think uh, something, uh, uh, yeah, something like that would be uh, uh, working, but we will be able to, to wordsmith this a little bit further. So, I'm um, sorry, I, I am confused now. So, is there a meeting or is there no meeting? No, there is no know? specific meeting focused on, on the uh, announcements, commitments made. Uh, we were not planning that meeting. But the, there is a meeting on, this, on, on, the, on the topic of ocean mapping. So, that, that, that meeting was uh, planned anyway, and, but uh, not in relation to the announced commitments, just as a statutory meeting. Thank you. Egypt, in light of that, would you still think that your um, uh, amendment will, will be a good compromise? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. No, I, I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood. I thought that there was a meeting about this. Thank you. So in this case, I, I withdraw it. Thank you. So we, now we, we stand, we go back to the uh, initial uh, position that uh, we are in. We have uh, Cook Islands, Philippines, St. Lucia, Grenada want to delete and Vietnam want, and France wanting to keep this uh, institutional arrangement. Is there any suggestion to um, um, a middle ground language? Maybe not welcome, maybe some other word instead of welcome that can... St. Lucia, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, as the intention is not to uh, uh, cancel things, but just to do things in the right order, what we would suggest is to take note of them. And then maybe we can, at a later stage, when we have a discussion, uh, 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 have a language that would uh, make this something that is also our project. Thank you. Um, France and Vietnam, are you good with this compromise? Taking note and takes note. Vietnam, you have the floor.
Vietnam, you're okay with the compromise language? Um, well, in fact, we prefer uh, appreciates, but uh, if uh, as a um, purpose of uh, compromise, maybe, yeah, we can go along with. Thank you, Franz. We, yes, uh, essentially, yes, it could satisfy us if it's going to achieve consensus. Thank you, Haiti. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to support the new amendment by St. Lucia, uh, we welcome Pronot uh, takes note. That's great. I think we have solved the issue of uh, paragraph 16. Can we can please, uh, can you read it, please, uh, Maya, so we can uh, adopt. Thank you, Madam Chair. So paragraph 16, as amended, reads as follows. Appreciate the active contribution of UNESCO to the One Ocean Summit, including the effective participation of the Director General in its high level segment. And the amendment is, and takes note of the institutional commitments announced. Thank you. Can we adopt? I see no comments. So paragraph 16 adopted as amended. So with that, I would like to uh, close the morning session and uh, we will adjourn at uh, uh, three uh, exactly so we can continue discussion on this item and continue on our hefty agenda. Bon appétit, everyone. Thank you. That was the chair of the Programme and External Relations Commission uh, ending this morning's meeting of the Commission. It is now around uh, three hours below, behind schedule. Um, apologies to those who were expecting the Geoparks discussion to be this morning, but it wasn't so. So the meeting in Paris has been suspended for two hours while they have some lunch. We will therefore come back to you again for another live stream in around about two hours time to bring you the discussions. Just to let you know, there are still discussions to be wrapped up on UNESCO and the ocean, the road to peace dialogue and action for tolerance and intercultural understanding. Then the agenda item on pro proclamation of the World Russian Language Day and then UNESCO Global Geoparks. We'll be bringing that to you live and discussion. Apologies to those who were expecting it this morning, but delegates got a bit behind time. So thank you to those who joined us live this morning. And we will join you again at 2 p.m. UK time, 3 p.m. Paris time to join back in when we hope this afternoon we will see the first debate and discussion on the eight new geoparks. Thanks to all who've joined us and we will see you again shortly this afternoon.